judgment and intelligence will come to order. Good morning. The purpose of this hearing is to receive testimony from expert witnesses in the security realm that will educate our efforts to mitigate threats posed by the Chinese Communist Party to the U.S. homeland. I now recognize myself for an opening statement. Well, good morning. Um, I'd like to uh, thank all of our witnesses for testifying today, bringing your expertise uh, to this committee and informing members of Congress about the threats that, uh, that we're currently facing. Despite years of attempts by the United States to develop a productive, fair, and honest relationship with the People's Republic of China, America has been met with dishonesty and aggression. The PRC government run by the Chinese Communist Party has deceived and manipulated us at every turn, committing espionage in our homeland and working to overturn the global rules-based order. The U.S. is now locked in a peer competition with the CCP in which the Chinese government is seeking to place itself at the top of the global world order while degrading America's power militarily, diplomatically, and economically. In recent months, events have shown us that the CCP has escalated this competition. On January 28th, a Chinese surveillance balloon entered U.S. airspace and spent the next eight days traveling over the majority of the continental United States. And while we do not know yet what kind of information the Chinese surveillance balloon was able to collect, we can be certain that the CCP's intention was to exploit sensitive sites, including military sites and critical infrastructure across our country. This Chinese surveillance balloon was a brazen display of espionage in the U.S. homeland, but it's ultimately one of the many ways that the CCP is working to exploit our vulnerabilities. Today, we must take the conversation beyond that balloon and discuss all avenues the CCP is threatening U.S. homeland security in. Through the CCP's aggressive national, national strategy of military-civil fusion, which aims to establish the People's Liberation Army as the dominant global military force by 2049, the Chinese government is stealing information from U.S. military and civilian targets. The majority of the threats China poses to the U.S. homeland security are occurring below the threshold of traditional conflict. We need to be cognizant of these threats and generate multifaceted solutions to deter them. These threats are already directly affecting American citizens. MD Anderson Cancer Center, for instance, one of the nation's top hospitals for cancer in my home state of Texas, ousted several scientists from the center in 2019 who had ties to the CCP. The scientists were flagged by the U.S. National Institute of Health regarding a variety of threats, including data security, intellectual property loss, and they were ultimately investigated by the FBI. This incident was by no means unique, with the CCP consistently targeting American research, research and innovation across the country. Additionally, the CCP is exploiting the open nature of American academia to steal vital research and development. Confucius Institutes, marketed as mechanisms to promote Chinese language and culture, have used the CCP to recruit American talent to support military civil fusion, monitor Chinese nationals who are studying at American universities, and have faced allegations of visa fraud. In recent years, the U.S. government has worked to close most of these Confucius Institutes. However, the CCP has made efforts to change the Institute's names or obfuscate their influence on American universities. Today, as a matter of fact, I am reintroducing with Chairman Green and Congressman Brad Winstrup the DHS Restrictions on Confucius Institutes and Chinese Entities of Concern Act, which passed out of this committee with bipartisan support last Congress. This bill works to close Confucius Institutes and any other programs with the same goal operating in the U.S. It also holds American universities accountable and ensures they prioritize their students' education and right to free speech above partnerships with Confucius Institutes that require universities to censor curriculums in favor of CCP ideology. I appreciate the support of Chairman Green, Congressman Winstrup, and look forward to a bipartisan discussion on this. In addition to threats to American IP and academic freedom, the CCP is targeting U.S. cybersecurity and critical infrastructure and undermining our economic security. Moreover, illicit fentanyl, fentanyl analogs, and related precursor chemicals are predominantly sourced from the PRC and then sent to Mexico. These poisonous drugs continue to fuel the tragic fentanyl crisis in our homeland. I am eager to discuss these challenges and, and more during today's hearing. Let me be clear about this hearing. To anyone who's listening at home or abroad, this conflict and the discussion today doesn't have anything to do with the Chinese people who are living in China 
uh, and, and being manipulated by the CCP. This conflict is with the CCP. It's an authoritarian regime that commits genocide against its own people. They censor free speech, not just in China, but across the globe, and they aim to end democracy as we know it. This hearing is the first of many, but it's a first step on this subcommittee and the Greater Committee on Homeland Security, uh, which we intend to confront the threats stemming from CCP influence that target our homeland. We will meet CCP aggression with strength, its deception with unflinching truth, and its attempts at exploitation with justice. We look forward to a bipartisan cooperation in this Congress as we all seek effective solutions to combat pervasive threats posed by the CCP to our homeland security. I now recognize uh, the ranking member, my ranking member, my friend from uh, Rhode Island, Mr. Magazineser, for his opening statement. Good morning. Uh, I want to thank Chairman Fluger for calling this important hearing and thank our witnesses uh, for coming today. Uh, I especially want to thank uh, Dr. Tyler Jost from Brown University in Rhode Island uh, for joining us, uh, along with our other expert witnesses. Uh, it is an honor to serve as ranking member of this subcommittee, and I look forward to working with you, Mr. Chairman, and all members of the subcommittee on a bipartisan basis to protect Americans from those who seek to threaten the security of the homeland. Make no mistake, China is the competitor with the greatest combination of intent and capacity to threaten U.S. global leadership. President Xi himself stated last year that by 2049, he wants to ensure that China and the CCP lead the world in terms of composite national strength and international influence. This is concerning for all of us who believe deeply that democracy and human rights must be advanced and protected here in our own country and across the world. Just last year, FBI Director Christopher Wray sat before this committee in this very room and warned that the greatest long-term threat to our nation's information and intellectual property and our economic vitality is the counterintelligence and economic espionage threat from China. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo has warned that the Chinese Communist Party is accelerating their efforts to fuse economic and technology policies with their military ambitions in ways that are forcing us, compelling us, to defend United States businesses and workers. We have already seen the Chinese Communist Party threaten the safety and privacy of American citizens through economic espionage and theft of U.S. intellectual property, the theft of personal data of American citizens through cyber attacks, the recent use of a spy balloon and other methods of surveillance to illegally gather intelligence on American territory, and the buildup of military capabilities that seek to eclipse the United States and our democratic allies. We must recognize that the threat posed by the CCP and take immediate action to best position the U.S. to confront China's attempts to undermine our national security. Today's hearing is an important opportunity for members of this subcommittee to demonstrate that we are united in a bipartisan effort to defend the privacy and safety of the American people, to protect U.S. industries and supply chains and enhance national security, all while remembering that one of the most important ways to counter the Chinese Communist Party's ambitions is to build an economy here at home that works for working people so we can show the world that our American system of democracy and freedom is more effective in lifting people up than the CCP model of autocracy and repression. Democrats are committed to doing this work with our Republican colleagues in a spirit of collaboration. Last year, thanks to the leadership of President Biden, Congress passed the Bipartisan Ships Act to invest $280 billion into domestic semiconductor production that will enhance our national security, strengthen U.S. industry, create jobs, reduce inflation, and improve our competitiveness with China. The CIA has recently launched a dedicated China Mission Center, and the State Department has launched a new Office of China Coordination in order to strengthen the U.S. diplomatic, military, and intelligence capabilities in meeting CCP threats. It is my hope that today's hearing will further illuminate the CCP's strategies to undermine our democracy, our economy, and way of life, and how Congress can work together to meet these challenges. As we do this work together, we must remember that the people of China and people of Chinese origin experience oppression and human rights violations at the hands of the authoritarian Chinese Communist Party and anti-Asian harassment and discrimination is too prevalent globally and here at home. So I also want to be abundantly clear that we do not condone 
any anti-Chinese or anti-Asian bigotry, and we must condemn any acts of anti-Asian discrimination in the strongest possible terms. Our struggle is not with the Chinese people, but rather with the Chinese Communist Party that is increasingly hostile to democracy and human rights. The CCP wants nothing more than to see Americans become divided and prejudiced, but they will be disappointed. Instead, we will outcompete the CCP by ensuring that America remains a beacon of freedom to the world and by continuing to provide safe harbor to those fleeing oppression and violence. That is how we will strengthen our nation and our economy. I look forward to hearing from today's witnesses and I yield back. Thank you, Ranking Member. Um, other members of the committee are reminded that opening statements may be submitted for the record. I am pleased to have a distinguished panel of witnesses before us today on this very uh, important topic. And I ask that our witnesses please rise and raise their right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you will give before the Committee on Homeland Security of the United States House of Representatives will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So I hope you got it. Thank you. Let the record reflect that the witnesses have answered in the affirmative. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to now formally introduce our witnesses. Uh, the Honorable William Evanina dedicated his life for 32 years to government service. In May of 2020, the Senate confirmed him as the very first director of National Counterintelligence and Security Center. In this position, Mr. Evanina was the head of counterintelligence for the entirety of the U.S. government. And his background in counterintelligence lends itself well today to our specific discussion which will focus heavily on the ways of CCP espionage efforts and how they impact our homeland, including the theft of US IP, the exploitation of academic research, and much more. Uh, Lieutenant General Joseph T. Guastello um, joins us from Mitchell Institute, uh, also a, a friend of mine in a former life as a fighter pilot, uh, and he is a senior fellow at the Mitchell Institute uh, for Aerospace Studies. Uh, Lieutenant General Guastello is a command pilot who most recently served as Deputy Chief of Staff of Operations at U.S. Uh, Air Force Headquarters. It was his job to oversee air power capabilities, including the Homeland Defense Mission of North American Aerospace Defense, or NORAD, and NORTHCOM. With the foundation of his impressive background, uh, Lieutenant General Gostello will be able to speak to America's evolving Homeland Security uh, needs as it faces a challenge never seen before uh, by the CCP. And given the recent shocking events, which I think were a wake-up call, uh, of the surveillance balloon. We're grateful uh, for your service, General, and for being here today. Uh, the Honorable Kerry Bingen joins us from the Center for Strategic and International Studies, or CSIS, where she is the Director of Aerospace Security Project. Prior to this, she served as Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence and Security. Her st strong background in Homeland Security and Defense Policies will be an exceptional addition as we discuss the growing and changing threat landscape, including threats to American critical infrastructure as it pertains to the U.S. peer competition with China. I'd now like to uh, once again recognize the ranking member, gentleman from Rhode Island, Mr. Magaziner, for a brief introduction of uh, the next witness. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I'm pleased to welcome our fourth witness, Dr. Tyler Jost. Uh, Dr. Jost is an assistant professor of political science and international and public affairs at Brown University in the great state of Rhode Island. Uh, he is also the Watson Institute Assistant Professor of China Studies and devotes his time and effort to improving our understanding of national security decision making in the People's Republic of China. Professor Joseph also previously served as a military intelligence officer with assignments in Afghanistan, U.S. Cyber Command, and the Office of the Secretary of Defense. Thank you to all of our witnesses for being here today, and I yield back. Thank you very much. Um, and again, thank you uh, to, to all the witnesses for taking time here. Um, I now recognize uh, the Honorable William Evanina uh, for an opening statement. Uh, we do have a timer and we'll keep them to, uh, to five minutes. Be recognized. Chairman Fluger, Ranking Member Magaziner, members of the subcommittee, it's, uh, it's an honor to be here with you today to discuss this really important topic. I spent 32 years of my career working for the US government, the FBI, the CIA, as the chairman referenced, as the first Senate confirmed director of the National Counterintelligence and Security Center. And I'm here before you today as the CEO of the Evanina Group, where I provide consulting services to boards of directors, CEOs, and executives on this exact threat we discussed today. Today's topic, China and the threat to the homeland, is an existential threat. It's the most complex, pernicious, aggressive, strategic threat our nation has ever faced. 
I proffer to the subcommittee that the U.S. private sector and academia have become the geopolitical battle space for China. Xi Jinping has one goal, to be the geopolitical, military, and economic leader of the world, period. Along with the Ministry of State Security, the People's Liberation Army, and the United Front Work Department, they drive a comprehensive whole country approach through their efforts to invest, leverage, infiltrate, influence, and steal from every corner of the United States. This is a generational battle for Xi, and it drives their every decision. We must approach this threat from the Communist Party of China with the same sense of urgency, spending, and strategy we have done for the past two decades to combat terrorism. I would offer to the subcommittee that we are in a terrorism event, a slow, methodical, strategic, persistent, and enduring event, which requires, in response, a degree of urgency of action. Let me be more specific. The Communist Party of China's capabilities and intent are second to none as an adversary. The cyber breaches, insider threats, surveillance and penetrations into our critical infrastructure, of which 85% is owned by the private sector, have all been widely reported. There's much more in the classified realm, but we've become numb to it as a nation. Additionally, it's estimated that 80% of American adults have had all of their private data stolen by the Communist Party of China. The other 20%, just most of it. Layering in the Communist Party of China's crippling stranglehold on many aspects of our supply chain, and what results is a daunting vulnerability and susceptibility of unacceptable proportions. When we layer in the current threat landscape, the sophisticated surveillance balloons, maritime port surveillance, strategic land purchases by military bases, terrestrial and space-based 5G threats, US-based Chinese police stations, Huawei, and TikTok, the collage begins to paint a very bleak mosaic. From a cybersecurity perspective, China possesses persistent and unending resources to penetrate our systems and exfiltrate our data or sit dormant and wait or plant malware on critical infrastructure for future hostilities. At the same time, the insider threat epidemic originating from the Communist Party of China has been nothing short of devastating to the U.S. corporate world. Additionally, the Communist Party of China strategically conducts malign influence campaigns at the state and local level with precision. This effort must be exposed and mitigated. So why does it all matter? Economic security is national security. Our economic global supremacy, stability, and long-term vitality is at risk. It's squarely in the crosshairs of Xi Jinping and the communist regime. In 2020, the estimated economic loss from theft of intellectual property and trade secrets just from the Communist Party of China, just from what we know in prosecutions, is between $300 billion and $500 billion per year. That equates to about $4,000 to $6,000 per year for an American family of four after taxes. The cost is real. So how do we mitigate these threats? We must create a robust public-private partnership with real intelligence sharing, while at the same time staying true to our core values, morals, and rule of law, which made America the greatest country the world has ever seen. This will take a whole nation approach. It will take time, and such approach must start with contextual awareness campaigns reaching a broad audience from every level of government, to chambers of commerces, to university campuses, and from the boardrooms to the business schools, because the why matters. U.S. boards of directors and investment leaders must begin to look beyond the next fiscal quarter earnings and begin to think strategically about how their investment decisions and awareness of long-term threat can impact not only their business model, but the economic and national interest of the United States. In conclusion, I investigated terror attacks after September 11th that led counterintelligence programs for the FBI. I would suggest that threat posed by China is much more dangerous to the longevity and sustainability of our nation than any terrorist threat actor. Thank you, look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Evanina. And I now recognize General Gostello for his opening statement. Chairman Fluger, Ranking Member, Magaziner, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. Uh, as an individual who spent over uh, three decades in service to our nation, I am also deeply concerned about uh, the threats the Chinese Communist Party uh, 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 drives towards the U.S. homeland, especially in the military swim lane. 
And uh, that's why events like this today are, are so important. On my last assignment on active duty, I was the Deputy Chief of Staff for Operations for the United States Air Force. Our job was to organize, train, and equip forces, Air Forces, and then present those forces to the combatant commanders around the world. That includes NORAD NORTHCOM, the command in charge of homeland defense. Um, I also uh, uh, developed a, a, a very good understanding of the threats that China poses to the United States and the capabilities they use to achieve those, those objectives. Um, I'd first like to highlight uh, or, or be, begin describing the threat that China poses to the United States and its allies. So in 1991, when the U.S. was celebrating um, the end of the Cold War and we also were celebrating victory uh, in Operation Desert Storm, China went to school on us. They took note and they, did, they started a very concerted and deliberate effort to modernize their military capabilities. And here we are three decades later, and they have largely met that mark. And they even seek further progress. That's why this year they saw even a, a significant increase in their defense spending. Their military now enjoys leading edge capabilities that include long range precision strike, hypersonic weapons, uh, advanced integrated air defense weapons, stealthy aircraft, surface to air missiles and electronic warfare. And several of those systems have the range to hold the U.S. homeland at risk. To, at risk. And so the, the Chinese spy balloon, as was mentioned before, which garnered significant attention this past February, is a, a very loud wake up call regarding the CCP's global ambition. Unfortunately, the U.S. is stretched thin when it comes to the capabilities and the capacity required to defend our homeland in, in the air domain, air and space domain. NORAD was originally designed to detect and defend North America from a catastrophic attack from the Soviet Union, later Russia. An additional role was added on after 9-11 to intercept, identify, and redirect uh, unidentified aircraft that were approaching restricted areas. So the NORAD radars were optimized and tuned to detect aircraft that met those, uh, those criteria. So balloons, until recently, generally did not fit in that category. But as threats evolve, including balloons, stealth aircraft, UAS, un unmanned aerial systems, cruise missiles, so must our detection and, and defense enterprise. This will require that we modernize current radars and install new sensors in emerging zones of vulnerability, not just over the nation, but well outside our sovereign territory so we can get a heads up that they're coming. We must invest resources in the NORAD mission. This, that command gets its aircraft from the U.S. Air Force, but the Air Force today is the oldest and the smallest it's ever been in history. We're still flying B-52s that are 60 years old, tankers that are over 50 years old, fighters over 30 years old, even the famed F-22, the best uh, air-to-air -air fighter ever made, first flew in 1997. The homeland defense, however, doesn't start here in the homeland. Homeland defense starts abroad with the combatant commanders, the combatant commanders that have the forces that are capable of um, an offensive punch against our adversary countries that, caught, that, that deters them from attacking us. That's where it begins. The Air Force has to be modernized in the numbers necessary to meet the demands of the national defense strategy, as well as to deter threats against our homeland. More specifically, consider the Air Force's fighter inventory is too small to meet real world demands. It's a major security concern for while other services possess fighters, the Air Force is specifically tasked with homeland security, the air sovereignty mission. The Air National Guard is the entity within the Air Force that bears the preponderance of homeland defense. And their, their, their mission is particularly hard hit uh, by the gap between old aircraft that are aging out of the inventory and a lack of new aircraft arriving to backfill those, those spots on the ramp. So homeland defense also requires investment in modernization and command and control, resiliency, ground and space-based sensors, data fusion, air refueling capabilities. Homeland defense is our highest priority mission. We need to start treating it that way. You know, and one more story, you know, to share with, with the group here. On January 8th, 2020, 11 Iranian ballistic missiles hit a U.S. base at Al-Assad in Iraq. I was the coalition forces air component commander at that time. We possessed the intelligence about the attack was going to happen. We were able to detect the missiles uh, at launch. We were able to track the trajectory. But when it came to shooting them down, to defeating the missiles, we lacked 
any options. Why? Because we did not have the, the capacity, the defensive capacity, due to the other global commitments that our force was, was spread across. American service members had to ride out that attack and, uh, and hope for the best. It was an appalling set of circumstances. Let's think of what, what could happen uh, against our homeland with threats like that. Adversaries like China understand these vulnerabilities. The United States is gradually waking up to this reality, but leaders have yet to seriously address the shortfall. We're still in a problem admiring phase, not in a solution implementation phase. That has to change. So we have the bravest men and women in uniform, but we owe it to them to ensure they're prepared for the mission we ask them to execute. We owe, we owe it to our American citizens to ensure they're protected from attack. America's homeland is no longer a sanctuary against uh, threats like China. We must recognize this new reality and aggressively close critical gaps in capacity and capability in the air domain. Thank you for uh, allowing us to focus on this topic today and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much for your uh, opening statement. I now recognize uh, Ms. Bingham. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Fluger, Ranking Member Magaziner, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for letting me appear before you today. I've been fortunate to examine these issues from my time at a technology startup, uh, time at the Department of Defense, and then here legislatively as a staffer on the House Armed Services Committee. Let me start by saying conflict with China is not inevitable, not inevitable. However, the Chinese Communist Party has ambitions to become the world's leading power and has undertaken a broad campaign using all, to, all tools of national power and influence to achieve its aims. While strategic competition and potential military conflict with China may seem abstract to many Americans, the Chinese surveillance balloon was a tangible, visible sign that the U.S. homeland is not out of reach of Beijing's threats. The PRC challenge is one of both national and economic security. It is not only the pacing military threat for the United States, but also the top threat to U.S. technology competitiveness. I'll discuss three areas where the CCP threat to the U.S. homeland is particularly acute. Technology acquisition, critical infrastructure, and influence operations. And then I'll offer a few recommendations to help address these challenges. First, technology acquisition. Beijing has made it a national goal to acquire foreign technologies to advance its economy and modernize its military. It continues to use both legal and illegal methods to target U.S. technologies, including in areas such as high-performance computing, biopharmaceuticals, robotics, energy, and aerospace. And it targets the people, information, businesses, and research institutions in the United States that underpin them. These methods include economic espionage, cyber data exfiltration, joint ventures, research partnerships, and talent recruitment programs, among others. My written testimony offers several specific examples of where the CCP has put these methods into practice. This matters for our defense, as our military's battlefield advantage has long rested on our superior technology. However, that is at risk as Beijing seeks to close the gap in our technology advantage. This matters for American businesses. As Mr. Evanina said, um, where two, 225 to $600 billion is the annual estimated cost to the U.S. economy from stolen intellectual property. CCP law and policy further bolsters these methods. For example, its 2017 national intelligence law requires organizations and citizens to support intelligence work and to keep it secret. Second, the CCP is targeting critical infrastructure in the United States. I fully anticipate that Beijing would seek to disrupt it, possibly through cyber attacks, especially early in a conflict. This could be motivated by a desire to deter U.S. action, affect U.S. decision making, delay the mobilization of U.S. forces, or affect the will of the American people. The government has taken some steps to share intelligence information on PRC campaigns to target critical infrastructure, such as oil and gas pipelines. Um, and, and importantly, it also included sharing tactics and techniques and procedures used by the Chinese. Third, the U.S. homeland is within reach of the PRC's influence activities. Examples include TikTok, that U.S. intelligence officials caution can be influenced by CCP-driven manipulation of its algorithms. They also include Operation Fox Hunt, where CCP-directed individuals spy on U.S.-based pro-democracy advocates, intimidate Chinese and Chinese-American students at universities, and pressure individuals in the United States to return to China, including by threatening their family members. The PRC also exerts influence through its Belt and Road Initiative, exporting terrestrial infrastructure, information and communications technologies, and other technology areas. This global influence directly impacts U.S. businesses and U.S. security interests here at home. 
One acute area of competition is in commercial telecommunications, including satellite communications, satellite broadband communications, like SpaceX's Starlink and Amazon's Project Kuiper, which CSIS recently examined. Further expansion of Chinese telecommunication services could boost Beijing's presence in foreign terrestrial networks, providing the CCP with remote access, enabling it to surveil users, block internet access, and censor information. I offer a few recommendations to help address these challenges. Expanding education and awareness, and this hearing is very important uh, on that regard, to, to remind the American public that the threat posed by the CCP is not abstract, nor solely a distant military conflict that, conflict that could take place across the Pacific. The American public and businesses need to understand the security and economic risks posed by the CCP and understand that they are a target. Expand intelligence sh threat sharing with the private sector, building off CISA's work to date so companies can better understand their vulnerabilities and make risk-informed decisions regarding their protection and resiliency. Transform counterintelligence and security missions, including leveraging technology like artificial intelligence to help identify supply chain vulnerabilities, track foreign agents, and illuminate disinformation. Leverage technology innovation. Maintaining U.S. technology leadership means not just preventing the transfer of technology to the PRC, but also setting the conditions for our innovation sector to stay ahead of the competition. Boosting cooperation with our allies and partners, which is a competitive advantage and source of strength the CCP does not have. And technology cooperation can be a strong feature of these relationships. And then finally, continuing to invest in a strong defense, including homeland defense, which is required to deter PRC aggression, build resiliency to attacks, and ensure that we have the trained people, posture, intelligence, weapon systems, and munitions to defend the United States and the American people. Thank you again for your time today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Ms. Bingen. Uh, the chair now recognizes Dr. Jost for his opening statement. <clears throat> Chairman Fluger, Ranking Member Maxiner, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. It is really an honor to be with you. My testimony is given as a scholar of Chinese foreign policy, and I emphasize this for two reasons. First, my role in academia is one of a researcher, not an administrator. And my testimony is not on behalf of or directly or indirectly associated with my employer. Second, as a former intelligence officer in the US military, I'm well aware that some of the most detailed reporting on topics as sensitive as Homeland Security remained classified. And as such, the testimony I'm best positioned to offer pertains to the scholarly conclusions that can be drawn based upon publicly available research. My remarks today will focus on two areas. One, the broader strategic context through which China's overseas intelligence collection and information campaigns should be viewed. And two, what the publicly available research to date can tell us about the scope and effectiveness of those campaigns. The competition between the United States and China represents one of the defining international challenges of this century. But in my view, at the center of this critical problem rests two issues that most divide Washington and Beijing, the future of Taiwan and perceptions that the other side poses an existential threat to the stability of the domestic regime. Thus, while it is important, while it is important to seriously evaluate the threats to the homeland posed by China, these should not distract attention from the issues that are likely to define the future of the global competition at their root. China's overseas activities that emerge from this contemporary strategic context can be loosely divided into two categories. The first focuses on China's intelligence collection, which is well documented. The recent incident in which a Chinese high altitude balloon traversed American airspace illustrates in vivid fashion that China is willing to assume risks in order to gather data against American targets. In parallel to intelligence collection, China engages in operations to disseminate information to foreign audiences. To date, the bulk of these activities are aimed at shaping global public opinion. In simplest terms, China presents foreign citizens with information with the hope that it will shape the target's attitudes and perhaps their behavior. These efforts to shape foreign public opinion through party propaganda are real and their scope is broad. But there are a few, comparatively few studies that apply validated research methods for estimating the causal effect that exposure to such messages have on uh, foreign audiences. In addition, trends in the global public opinion should provide some comfort. If one judges the effectiveness of China's public diplomacy campaign based solely 
on China's approval rating in foreign countries, the effort has, at least to date, been a failure. Finally, what evidence we do have suggests there are several reasons why these operations might actually prove to be less effective than some of us might fear. By emphasizing gaps in public knowledge, I am not suggesting that we can dismiss potential threats that China poses to the U.S. homeland. The fact that China has demonstrated its intent to engage in both intelligence collection and efforts to shape foreign public opinion, coupled with the competitive nature of the bilateral relationship broadly, is sufficient cause for serious attention. Rather, my hope is that emphasizing what we do and do not yet know can illuminate uh, policy recommendations, which are detailed in my written testimony. Allow me to briefly summarize them here. First, the U.S. government should devote resources towards publicly available research that fills in gaps in our knowledge regarding China's activities abroad. Second, the U.S. government, the US government should use diplomatic channels to reestablish opportunities for American researchers to better understand the Chinese political system and do so in ways that they feel protected from potential exploitation and detainment by the Chinese authorities. Third, the U.S. government needs to better disclose its understanding of the threats that China poses to homeland security, and specifically, it needs to provide citizens with more data about the different risks that American citizens assume when they use foreign technologies. Thank you very much for your time, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Dr. Jost. Uh, members will now be recognized in order of seniority, alternating between Republican and Democrat uh, for five minutes of questioning. It's my hope today that we will be able to go through um, maybe two rounds of questioning. Um, and I reckon the chair now recognizes uh, myself for five minutes of questioning. Um, I think what we heard there is just a, an incredible breadth of knowledge uh, and experience about what the Chinese Communist Party has been doing, you know, for several decades, what they are currently doing and the threats that as that wake up call moment happened uh, several weeks ago with the Chinese surveillance balloon, that it's incumbent upon us to really start uncovering these threats and, and focusing on them. And, and quite honestly, from what we've heard from this panel, thank you for your, all of your um, opening statements. Uh, we, could, we could have several hearings uh, on the individual subjects, but uh, appreciate the time here. I, I'll start with uh, Mr. Evanina. When you look at the ownership of property in the United States, and we go back, PRC based ownership of, of U.S. farmland in the last 20 years has jumped from about $81 million in 2010 to $1.9 billion at the end of uh, 2021. And moreover, I think it's um, widely reported that a lot of the PRC or PRC linked ownership is adjacent to very sensitive uh, facilities, government facilities, military facilities in the United States. Can you provide insight as to why that is, what the goal is, and what they're doing with those lands? Thanks for the question, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm gonna try really hard to stay in the unclassified realm here, but it's a comprehensive strategic plan that goes back about a decade to the uh, CCP's plans and intentions, which incorporates uh, multifaceted intelligence apparatus, both the MSS and, and the PLA. And it starts what I would call and phrase outside the fence line of DOD facilities. That began with the Huawei cell tower capabilities, tracking and being able to monitor not only troop movements, but weapon silos and other areas. The strategic purchases of businesses outside of, of not only military bases, but military residential areas. Uh, the influence of the Chinese be able to do software and malware manipulation penetration on electrical grids and power stations outside of the military bases. I think the next act, act, aspect is exactly what you referenced, right? What is the next thing that the Communist Party of China and Russia for that matter, are looking to exploit outside the fence line of US military bases? That includes land purchases. And I think when you look at all the land that not only the Chinese Communist Party and their proxies have purchased, you're gonna find a strategic military base and or uh, subterrestrial things in the ground, as well as uh, energy issues to the military base. And also we look at the um, balloon we just saw, very similar trajectory to those areas. So it's a comprehensive strategic plan that you see from the Communist Party. Do you think there was coordination uh, between uh, staying in, in the unclassified, I mean, it, the, the lands that the balloon flew over, purchases that we've seen, I mean, could there be coordination either now or in the future? Absolutely. There's nothing done by the Communist Party that does not have strategic uh, 
uh, entity or coordination. And I think we'll see in the future, uh, if it's declassified, uh, what some of the things the balloon was surveilling and or potentially um, doing more surveillance too. Thank you. Uh, General Gosello, thanks for the, the testimony and you know the threats that you mentioned that you're wor very worried about and concerned about. What do we, I mean, what keeps you up at night on, on the air power threats and what needs to happen resource-wise, specifically here in NORAD NORTHCOM, in order to uh, identify, de deter, detect, uh, and defeat? Uh, thank you, Chairman. What, what keeps me up at night is the age uh, and the capabilities of our existing air and space forces. You know, for 20 years, we've been engaged in a very land-centric campaigns in the Middle East. We've been doing counterinsurgency, counterviolent extremists, counterterrorism, all important for our nation. But during that 20 years, uh, we did not invest in air and space forces to the extent we needed to. So we're left with that old fleet that I described before. You know, a 30-year-old fighter can do fine providing close air support in Iraq or Afghanistan against uh, a low-end threat, but it's not going to survive very well against, and it's not going to survive in the China fight, and it, but more so, it doesn't deter China. And so we have to realize the investment that's needed in the air and space domain is, has been neglected and we have to get her after it for the exact reasons that's been described by our, our expert panelists on, on China. And that's, that's what keeps me uh, up at night. When you look at the threats that are being posed, hypersonics, the ranges that are increasing, the ability to reach out and touch us, how important is um, NORAD, the Joint Air Power Enterprise, to the defense of our homeland? You know, NORAD, the National Defense Strategy, two of them now in a row, have said that homeland defense is the number one priority. Uh, problem is, we haven't resourced resourced it to that that, that to that extent that, that, that our words say. And um, the, the the commanders of the uh, NORAD have asked for a modernization of radars for years now and have have not gotten it. And uh, that would have helped us detect those balloons sooner. Uh, and then the aging fighters, you know, almost every major, major metropolitan city in America is defended by our, by our Air National Guard fighters that are getting older and older. They don't have the capabilities, the radars that they need, not only for the balloons, but the radars they need for the real threat, which would be a cruise missile attack against our, our homeland. And so that, that's what concerns me. Thank you. Uh, my time has expired. I yield back and now recognize the ranking member. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, it is clear that uh, the Chinese Communist Party is taking a whole-of-government approach to advancing its ambitions uh, at the expense of U.S. and democratic interests, and therefore we must take a whole-of-government approach to meeting that threat. So that covers homeland security, defense, commerce, State Department, etc. Um, so uh, I'm going to focus on the homeland realm. Uh, Dr. Joes, can you expand on the methods that the CCP is using to influence public opinion, both here at home in the U.S. and globally, and what more we could be doing uh, to measure uh, their efforts and to mitigate uh, their success. Sure. Thank you very much for the question. Um, the bulk to date of China's influence operations, uh, both in the United States and abroad, are focused on what you might say are winning friends and influencing people, right? Um, this is uh, coming directly from Xi Jinping, who has directed the party's apparatus uh, that has deep roots in propaganda to leverage those capabilities in order to tell China's story well to the world. Um, it is interesting to think about the ways in which uh, China's institutions domestically are sort of naturally positioned um, to, to make that transition from a domestic-based propaganda machine to an international one. Um, if one thinks from the perspective of the Chinese Communist Party, from their perspective, uh, domestic propaganda has worked thus far in keeping the CCP in power. Those capabilities and organizations exist, and it is easy to see how they would assume that those same types of propaganda uh, would work in foreign audiences. Um, to date, however, as I re uh, emphasized in my written testimony, we don't necessarily have uh, the best uh, evidence to judge whether or not these propaganda efforts outside of uh, Chinese borders have been effective. Um, as, as I mentioned in the opening statement, um, we do know that global public opinion towards China, particularly in the United States and the countries uh, with whom we uh, share closest interests, has declined substantially 
in the past few years, which would actually suggest uh, that from a certain perspective, uh, the propaganda doesn't necessarily work as well as the CCP would hope. That being said, there's a multitude of things that are confounding that relationship, of course, right? The fact that there has been a uh, global pandemic, uh, the fact that it could be working in certain areas and not others, certain framings that uh, the Chinese Communist Party and its diplomats use are more effective than others. And it's one of the reasons why I think there needs to be more research on this matter and uh, something the U.S. government can certainly help with. Thank you. Um, Mr. Uh, Evan, uh, Evanina, um, in your written testimony uh, on the threat of corporate espionage and the theft of intellectual property, uh, you recommended the creation of an economic threat intelligence agency to assist U.S. companies in protecting themselves against corporate espionage. Can you expand on uh, uh, how that should be structured to be most effective if, if we were to do it? Thank you, Ranking Member. Um, I recommended an entity uh, similar to the FSISAC for, that is specifically geared towards the economic awareness and understanding of IP and trade secret theft and emerging of not only the, the thought process, but the ideation, but also the laws that govern our patent processes and our IP theft around the world and to mirror what the Communist Party are doing around them and then educate our American businesses, the general counsels, the people that do law for them outside counsel to understand what it looks like when you're about to be um, stolen and robbed from IP theft and be able to provide that real time actual intelligence from the intelligence community, DHS and commerce and treasury to businesses who are not only at risk, but in the process, because once it happens, it's too late. The data is already gone. The government needs to be more forward leaning and left the boom. Well, thank you. I found that very interesting. And so, you know, perhaps as a follow up after this hearing, you can send us some recommendations in more detail about, you know, where it should be housed, how it should be staffed, which agencies should be involved. Because um, uh, I think that's a very interesting uh, uh, recommendation. Yes, sir. And I yield back. Right. The gentleman yields. Um, the chair now recognizes the uh, gentleman from uh, New York, Mr. D'Esposito. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all. So dozens of uh, demonstrators protested outside of the building uh, in New York City's Chinatown last month. Uh, the building, uh, which is owned by the Cheng Li Association, operates what they call a service station. Uh, and it, they're accused of operating a CCP police station that allegedly conducts surveillance and intimidates CCP uh, descendants and activists. Like the recent incident with the Chinese surveillance balloon, this station could be the latest CCP action that violates U.S. sovereignty and poses a threat to national security. Uh, it's been reported that there's a hundred, over a hundred of these offices around the world. Um, Mr. Vinya, please describe your concerns surrounding this potential uh, CCP police station in terms of counterintelligence threats and the safety of Americans. Thank you, Congressman. I think when you look at that specific uh, issue in New York City, <coughs> and the subsequent search by the Department of Justice and FBI, which is a high threshold to obtain, it's, it's a manifestation of the strategic plan of the Communist Party of China to not only influence, manipulate their own um, diaspora here in the United States, but provide an intimidation factor. And I would say that this issue in New York and the search of that domestic police station is in part in partnership with their Operation Fox Hunt that my uh, colleague Ms. Bickham talked about, which is an international program, but very, very aggressive in the United States to surveil and try to rendition uh, Chinese uh, diaspora here who were anti Xi and regime. And they've been very successful at it. And the fact that this happens on our American soil, to me, is unacceptable. I agree. Uh, so it's been reported that there's over 100 throughout the world. Uh, do we know how many are actually in uh, on U.S. soil? I do not, but I'm pretty confident our law enforcement, uh, both at the state, local, and federal level, are pretty aware of that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. The gentleman yields. I now recognize my good friend, the gentleman from California, Mr. Correa. Mr. Chairman from Texas, thank you very much. I've been sitting in this committee for a number of years. Cyber, big issue, continues to be a big issue. A number of testimonies ago, we heard that uh, Russians have essentially penetrated most of our infrastructure, just like we penetrated most of their infrastructure. So we have a standoff, so to speak. Action by either side is too expensive, so to speak, in terms of the damage. 
Now we have a situation nas internationally, a, a geopolitical realignment where Russia and China are beginning to work much more collaboratively. Uh, my question, common thought, first of all, Mr. Ivania, how do you see this, given that our foreign minister, China's foreign minister recently said, uh, essentially warned us of, uh, of conflict and confrontation in the United States. How do you see this evolution in terms of multiplier effect of a threat on the United States, Russia and China working together? How real is that? And what's the potential for the future of continued um, collaboration to really challenge the United States in ways we have not envisioned in the past. Thank you. Mr. Congressman, I, I concur with your statement. And I think it is a very concerning issue when two nation states who don't like each other are emerging against one common enemy, the United States. Geopolitically, um, diplomatic. Well, you're saying that enemy of an enemy is my friend. Is that the situation? I was going to say that, yeah. but it was a bit better you said it. But yes, correct. And I think when we look at, I'll stick in my lane here from, you mentioned the Russians' penetration to our systems, uh, both IT, and OT, uh, SCADA, ICS systems here in the United States, um, probably predates the, the Communist Party of China, but I'm, con I'm pretty confident the Communist Party of China has either duplicated those penetrations or ridden along those. And I think the sharing of the intelligence services between uh, Vladimir Putin and Russia and the Communist Party is probably the most problematic for me uh, is, is what they see, because that's the most invisible part of that threat. I think that right now we still have an edge when it comes to cyber, two or three years maybe. So I often think of defense, a good offense is the best defense you can have. So if I may, what would you recommend moving forward would be the best way to counter these unprecedented challenges that a country has. Congressman, I think you make a good point. It's probably important that we reiterate the fact that as much as what you're hearing here is depressing, demoralizing, and it's a legitimate threat to our nation, we must pause and remember that we have the most amazing military and intelligence and law enforcement capabilities the world has ever seen. The women and men of DOD and the intelligence community are phenomenal. Our capabilities are second to none in cyber, military apparatus, and intelligence. So Americans should go to sleep at night, be thankful for the fact that offensively, we've never seen anything better than we can do. Unfortunately, it's today, not public. Today. Yes, sir. Please continue. Didn't mean to interrupt you. Anybody else have comments, thoughts, or my questions? Ma'am? Congressman, if I might build off of that on, on cyber, when I look at the homeland, so much of our commerce and activity rides on commercial infrastructure. And building off of Mr. Evanina's point earlier, um, it's very important that the government figure out how to share threat intelligence information with the private sector, with those oil, gas, pipeline, energy, financial services sectors. In real um, time. In real time, and that's the key. And if you're a business, you hear, these, the, you hear this top level talk, but what's particularly valuable is figuring out a way to provide security read-ins to some of these business leaders, bring them into the tent, but also share specific tactic techniques procedures with them. It's a lot, it's one thing to hear about this general Chinese threat, it's another thing to hear, hear the tactics that they're using to go after you, and then you realize, holy crap, that's what's been happening in my network now, let me work with you to take some preventative measures. 30 seconds, anybody else? The chair, I yield, thank you very much. Oh, please. Just uh, amplifying Ms. Bigham, I would, I would point, um, your question, sir, to the incredible success our intelligence and defense department has had with uh, Ukraine and preventing Russian cyber capabilities, not only in Ukraine and Europe and here in the U.S. as a, a category for us being ahead of others in the cyberspace. Thank you for ending on a good positive note. Mr. Chair, I yield. The gentleman yields. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Arizona, former Navy SEAL, Mr. Crane. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you guys for attending today. We appreciate it. You know, it's not often up here that, you know, uh, me and my colleagues on the other side of the aisle can agree upon something. So it is great to uh, be in agreement on the threat that China is. 
Obviously, the American people are watching and they're very concerned when they see spy balloons flying over the United States, farmland being bought up near, you know, uh, farms, uh, fentanyl coming across our southern border. We know, you know, where the origin of a lot of that comes from, theft of intellectual property, uh, covering up the origins of COVID, uh, Chinese police stations in some of our, some of our cities. Uh, my first question is for you, uh, Mr. Evanina. Did I pronounce that correctly? Sir, do you know what a leak capture is? Yes, sir. Can you, uh, for the panel and for maybe some of those watching, can you give, can you uh, describe what a leak capture is, please? Congressman, I can. I would probably prefer to some of the more better informed experts here on that, on that panel for that particular de definition. Okay. Is there anybody want to take a stab at it? Sir, you, am I correct that uh, you uh, are an expert in counterintelligence, right? Yes, sir. So can you just give me a really broad, doesn't have to be super specific. What is elite capture? Yeah, I think when you look at it, uh, the capabilities and intent of our adversaries and our ability to be proactive and make uh, an affirmative effort to capture um, telecommunications to humans, to technology uh, in or at the battlefield or in the gray space. Uh, provides us the best uh, venue or avenue for uh, potential to win. Okay. Um, can you give me some examples of how that's often done? How that's carried out? Sure. Uh, we Well, first of all, I would say a lot of it's done with uh, authorities that are granted to both NSA and the FBI uh, overseas. Uh, Section 702, our abilities to capture telecommunications conversations to foreign adversaries, both the foreign uh, born, but are also overseas, that gives us leads uh, and intentions of nefarious activities, both terrorism and counterintelligence, espionage, of those actors overseas that are, as Ms. Bigman said, riding on uh, commercial capabilities that are around the world. And that capability allows the U.S. to be able to pre-identify and do uh, threat and warning to actors here in the U.S., both from a systems, data, and people perspective. Would you say that it's accurate that um, foreign states and actors often try and compromise and corrupt leaders and officials within our own government? Would you say that that's a form of elite capture? I would, and it's uh, done uh, quite regularly uh, for, for decades. Would you say that it's uh, often true that family members are often used in these types of efforts to corrupt uh, foreign leaders, officials? Congressman, uh, for the last past decade, I've spent my time in three different organizations advising and informing uh, Americans, members of Congress, about the threat to them as a person. And it always starts with uh, family members utilization of mobile telephones. Thank you. Sir, are you also aware of some of the reported business dealings of Hunter Biden with individuals linked to the Chinese Communist Party? Only what I've seen in public reporting, sir. What did you think of the uh, reporting that you read, sir? I'm not sure I could actually opine on what I've read in public reporting, but, but I could say that um, the TTPs of which foreign entities are utilized against Americans and family members is tried and true and very predictable and reportable. Let me ask you a follow on to that, sir. Did you find the reports, whether you believe them or not, did you find those uh, reports concerning just with all of your knowledge in this space and how you've seen this type of thing play out in the past? Yes, sir. I think when you look at uh, what's been reported publicly about um, the potential tactics and techniques uh, that were displayed publicly about uh, the potential for uh, penetration to a family member of the United States president is something that most intelligence services try to do uh, regularly. Thank you. I yield back. The gentleman yields. Um, we'll now proceed to a second round of questions. And if we have other members that had previous commitments that show up, then we'll, we'll yield that uh, initial question to them. The chair now recognizes myself for uh, additional round of five minutes of questions. Um, Ms. Bingham, thank you for your 
uh, all, your expertise and your testimony today, um, I'd, I'd like to focus on that critical infrastructure piece and on what you said, um, you know, that the CCP is targeting critical infrastructure and that you fully anticipate that should a crisis, um, hopefully one does not happen, but should one happen and unfold that Beijing would seek to disrupt the operations of, of critical infrastructure. And then I was very intrigued by your discussion on sharing information with local state partners, law enforcement, and, and otherwise. From the colonial incident to now, have we as a federal government, and specifically within the Department of Homeland Security, can you give us your opinion of how we are sharing information, if that is effective, and if our critical infrastructure uh, private partners, because most of, most of that is owned by private industry, are they ready for what's next should that colonial incident happen again? Uh, Chairman, th thank you for that question. And I think the colonial incident, though not, not attributable to China, as the government has come out and said, um, highlights the catastrophic impacts that can occur um, as a result of, of a potential attack against cyber infrastructure, cyber critical infrastructure. Um, your point is exactly right from everything that I've seen previously. Um, I would anticipate that as a crisis or conflict builds, uh, that the CCP would seek to target critical infrastructure early on. Now, this is there's a first mover advantage here, I would say, in terms of the kind of the tools that they would seek to use uh, to delay or, or to deter us or to potentially delay us. Um, on the point of, of uh, information sharing, um, I think the success that I would point to is uh, summer of 2021. I thought CISA did a very good job bringing in oil and gas operators. Uh, and, and uh, providing very specific detail on the, um, the Chinese or the CCP cyber intrusion campaign, what specifically they were targeting, but, but equally important how they were doing it. So the tactics, techniques and procedures. Um, but that's one sector and there are several different critical infrastructure sectors. And I think there's some very good intelligence information that the community has that they could provide, whether it be to financial services, uh, the electrical grids, et cetera. Thank you very much. Um, I'll turn to General Costello. What, what, what's the impact of eight days transit of a balloon, a surveillance balloon? You know, when we look at uh, the the fact that it transited and then you know got to the uh, the Atlantic Ocean before it was eventually shot down. What what kind of message is that sending? What's the impact uh, strategically? It's a it's a, it's a significant uh, wake up call, like we discussed before, that that, a, that a, an air vehicle could. Tra traverse American airspace for that long and, 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 and be afforded the opportunity to collect that much information. You know, a balloon is up there around 12 miles up. Satellites are 350 miles. So it's down in close it, or it hangs out for a long time. The potential for collection is significant. And so ideally the thing would have been taken down prior to hit, hitting U.S. airspace. But uh, like I said, they exploited the scene. Uh, I don't think that'll happen again. We have to talk to government officials about it. But we don't know until we fully exploit what, what was flown over, what, what they could have gotten or what they got. Uh, but to me, it's a very grave uh, violation of our sovereignty. Does something like that embolden the CCP um, and you know, reduce our, our deterrence? And then what do we have to do to claw that back if it does? Absolutely. Anytime an authoritarian regime does something of that nature and we don't do anything about it, uh, they'll think, let's, what, what can I get away with next? And so uh, we have to close this gap. We also have to demonstrate cre credible capability that we can affect them in some way of our choosing. I think that's important for us, not only have the capability, but the will to do so. That's, that's how you deal with a regime of that nature. Um, Mr. Evanina, let, let's turn to the precursors that China produces that are then used in the production of fentanyl. Um, and the, the connection between the cartels that are, you know, taking these products that they're making fentanyl and then eventually getting it in the United States. And can you kind of talk to your opinion as a former uh, intelligence expert on that flow, what the CCP and the cartels uh, are doing to, to work together, collude and, and produce a, a very deadly substance? Mr. Chairman, this is a, a very important topic, not only for this conversation, but for our nation. I think the recent reporting is that over 100,000 people have died uh, in the last year, 12, 15 months, uh, from a fentanyl overdose. It's, that's multiple times 
of what happened on 9-11, right? So for our nation to not look at fentanyl as a national epidemic that stems from a nation state threat actor is probably unacceptable and we have to be more vigilant in what we do. We, we, we can map the production of the precursors from China to Mexico, to the drug gangs, to the American soil. It's a clear, and I know our intelligence and military apparatus are working hard to disrupt that, but it takes more than that to disrupt. There has to be a preemptive effort to put China on notice that this process of killing Americans must stop. And we have to look at it as a terrorism event. Thank you very much. My time has expired. The chair yields back and now recognizes the ranking member, Mr. Magaziner. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Jost, uh, in your testimony, uh, you wrote that while the evidence shows that uh, Chinese propaganda efforts in the United States and in other aligned countries do not show evidence of much success yet, we do not have as much data uh, in the global south, in the emerging markets. And we know that China is making big investments uh, in many of these emerging countries for strategic reasons. I think that's very important for our work here in Congress because there's always a perennial debate on the level of foreign aid that we provide to those same nations. So can you just expand a little bit on why this topic is important and what the tie is to the homeland security of the United States? Thank you, sir. Um, so when one thinks about how propaganda works, um, we have to think about why a target audience would ever believe it. Um, if I were to come in here and read um, a bit of Chinese communist propaganda, I obviously would not, um, but if I were, uh, folks in this room would discount that bit of information pretty significantly. And the reason is that they know it's propaganda. Um, so the effectiveness of such an information or influence campaign rests upon the ability of targets to be able to understand that uh, the uh, the well, political scientists were told the cue giver, the actor who is giving the information, doesn't have their best interests at heart. Um, so that's that's component number one, and component number two is some baseline level of distrust of that that target state. So what we don't know, I think, is in countries outside of the United States and countries that the United States shares very close relationships with, is that baseline level of mistrust that is present in most of the U.S. public, uh, present in those other countries, uh, which would then cause the targets in those countries to discount the cue or discount the, pro the propaganda. Yeah, thank you. And I, I think especially when we look at things like access to rare earth minerals that are critical to our economy and, and other factors, uh, those relationships with the Global South are important. China certainly understands that, and we must understand it as well. Um, uh, question for Dr. Joseph, anyone, I, you know, Chairman Fluger and I both in our opening statements were clear that our adversary here is not the Chinese people. Uh, it is uh, an authoritarian and anti-democratic regime that is becoming increasingly aggressive. Um, on the topic of anti-Asian hate globally, uh, would you agree, and this Dr. Jost, but anyone else can weigh in as well, that it is important that we combat anti-Asian hate in all of its forms for a range of reasons, but including the fact that we do not want to give the Chinese Communist Party uh, ammunition to fuel their propaganda, uh, both in China and here at home. Thank you, ranking member. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Anti-Asian, pardon me, anti-Asian racism has absolutely no place in American society. I think we can all agree on that. And I think we can also all, uh, all agree that uh, the reasons why that is unacceptable in the United States are orthogonal to whether or not the Chinese Communist Party is able to exploit it, just as you said. That being said, it is true that uh, Chinese diplomats uh, and the Chinese state do call attention uh, to these trends. Uh, so for example, there is an annual report that the Chinese state uh, issues on human rights in the United States, which oftentimes calls out uh, these types of events, both broadly in terms of race and specifically on anti-Asian uh, uh, racial issues. Um, I would uh, double down and amplify uh, Doctor's uh, statement here, and as I had in my written statement, uh, this is clearly not about uh, the Chinese citizens, uh, both in China or in the United States. This is an issue of Xi and the Communist Party regime and their intelligence services and their strategy. 
clear. Uh, however, that makes it very difficult. And, and not only to the doctor's point, I think we have to be work very, very clear to say this all the time. This is not about our Chinese citizens. But most importantly, the United Front Work Department will use that against us at every single point. So it's a double-edged sword. The more that we don't say it, the more the communist regime and the United Front Work Department will use it against us when we don't say it. Omission is a denial that it's real. And I'll just close by saying I think this is yet another reason why it is important that this committee and this Congress uh, focus on combating the rise of racially motivated extremism uh, here in the homeland as well. And I thank you all very much again for your testimony. General Gills, now recognize Mr. D'Esposito. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, in your capacity as the director of the National Counterintelligence and Security Center, you estimated that the theft of intellectual property by the PRC cost America as much as $500 billion, with a B, a year. Uh, can you just describe the impact this theft has on the everyday American, like people back in my district and on Long Island? Congressman, I think uh, to make this succinct, uh, as I mentioned in my oral remarks, the real impact is about $4,000 to $6,000 per American family after taxes. It's a real cost to an American uh, homeowner, family member. I'm sorry, can you just say that number again? I apologize. Between $4,000 and $6,000 per year per American family of four after taxes is what that $500 billion of intellectual property theft equals. And those are known cases. That's not a guesstimate. Secondarily, I'll proffer to the subcommittee, those aren't the real costs. The real costs for all that IP theft, ideation theft, manufacturing theft, results in the Communist Party of China building that same capability overseas, getting it to patent in global markets before we do, and then selling it back to the American people, the American public and corporations. And then multiple CEOs have said to me, Bill, it's not just the dollar value of our product that's been stolen, it's the manufacturing plants that aren't built in the U.S., and it's the tens of thousands of jobs that are not created here in the U.S. because we lost that patent ideation technology of the Communist Party of China, who went to global market first. And what are some ways that the, the U.S. government is working to identify uh, counterintelligence issues that threatened American IP? Well, I think there was a robust... Um, Agenda probably starting in 2015 and 16, and I, I here I'd have to commend the efforts of Senator Burr, uh, Senator Rubio, and Senator Warner uh, on Sissy to have what I would call uh, the Chinese roadshows, where we went out around the country and briefed thousands of CEOs of industries about this uh, threat in from different sectors, financial services, energy, private equity, venture capital, telecommunications, to make sure that they understood what they were doing has a direct impact on national interest and national security. I think that members of Congress, both in the House and Senate, should have a robust capability to go back to the home districts and document these threats to the chambers of Congress and where you live and to economic development corporations and to small businesses so they can identify this nefarious capability early and often to prevent it before it happens. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your service. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields, now recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Correa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Wanted to focus a little bit on our backyard south of the border. Um, had a chance to go to El Salvador a few years ago and learned that China was looking to acquire, purchase 80% of their coast and really build a deep water port in that area. Today, I'm really, really bothered that uh, world's largest oil reserves in Venezuela are essentially in a Venezuelan government, government of Venezuela, that it has very close ties to Russia and to China. This is our backyard. Uh, it's my understanding we, we still have a good brand south of the border. Most countries, Colombia included and others, still like the brand of America, the American dream, so to speak. Again, thinking about best defense being a good offense, what do we do to make sure that we keep our backyard, our backyard secure and not have these kinds of uh, advances by other countries? I'll start, Congressman. I think there's some great answers in the panel as well. I think when we look at South America specifically, we could look, um, as my colleagues mentioned, uh, subsequent to 9-11, uh, we concentrated on counterterrorism. 
and we missed the boat of the influence uh, of both uh, Russia and China and South America. And that influence comes with a price because they provide uh, critical infrastructure for free. Uh, they provide mobile phones to, the, to employ, uh, citizens of South American countries for free. Specifically, the Chinese invest a lot of money in South America to have them beholden to their interests, as well as Russia did historically. I think we probably, and, and this is getting more in the policy lane, have to be more aggressive and offensive with our brand and our capabilities and our investment in South America to help us in the long run. We make the best medicines of the world, best COVID vaccine. We're essentially a breadbasket of the world. How can you use those assets to really project our presence in the backyard? Thoughts? Lieutenant General. Sir, uh it's a fantastic question and it's absolutely a concern. Chinese investment in countries around the world, uh, especially when we're absent, allows inroads uh, for them to develop relationships, uh, not, just, not just buy what uh, is immediately there, but also leads to future investments and other things. Uh, and, and it comes as a detriment to the U.S. You know, like I said, homeland defense doesn't start in the homeland. It starts overseas, not only with a credible capability that we need to have, but also with our allies and partners. And so we're, if we become isolationists, if we cede that terrain to the Chinese, we're going to pay a price militarily. And, uh, you know, we, uh, when your Chinese military comes into countries, it, it, it allows them to start to train with the Chinese, develop a relationship with Chinese, and it, and it, and it results in an in inability for us to leverage them the way we, way we should. And so it's a very significant thing for us, and we need to look at that. One last point, and that's on arms sales. A lot of times we don't sell things to countries because we have issues with the country, which is understandable, but sometimes they're going to buy it anyway. And when that happens, it's a choice between them being buying Chinese or buying American. Sometimes we need to think, hey, maybe it's worth it should buy American. General, I'm going to challenge you here. Did you use the word absence? Or absence? Did you say that? So I may have absence or well, less. Are you less, saying we're not doing less. our job up here, going overseas, visiting people, being diplomats as members of Congress? Do we need to do more of that? <laughs> sir, I think you're doing a great job. Um, no, that's uh, not the answer I'm uh, looking for, sir. <laughs> you just said something, and I want to make sure all of our no, I do members of Congress understand exactly. That's a great point. And I want you to back it because we do need to show our faces around the world. We need to do that. General, I want to thank you for that, qu uh, that comment. You're absolutely right. We do need to show our faces around the world. Our, engage our military does a lot of international engagement, in mill to mill. Uh, we need that same engagement at other levels of government. Our state does that. But getting out and seeing and understanding from those allied and partner perspectives. You know, the one big advantage the U.S. has militarily is that we have a lot of friends out there. That China doesn't, it doesn't enjoy that same thing. We're going to lose those friends if we don't get out there and engage. Because those friends allow us to base in their countries. They'll support us. They'll back us up in international forums. And it happens if we engage them. Thank you, sir. Chairman, are you Gentlemen, Yields, uh, we'll now recognize my good friend and national security expert, somebody who spent 20 plus years in the U.S. Navy, Mr. Gonzalez from Texas. Uh, thank you, Chairman. And I, I want to uh, associate my comments with my oh, my good friend, Lou Carrera. Him and I took a trip to Central America, we went to Guatemala, we went to Honduras, and we went to El Salvador. And one of the, the uh, I guess, surprising things is uh, that, that I wasn't aware of is no members of Congress has visit, had visited that area in three years. So to the point, yes, there's a military aspect of it, but there's also a, a diplomatic, we'd like to see the State Department do more, but up here in Congress in a bipartisan manner, we need to be doing more in our own backyard. And I know uh, many of us on this committee are committed to doing this, to doing just that. Uh, my first question is is for is for you, General. I just got back from a trip from Taiwan. Uh, it's the second trip to Taiwan in the past 14 months. Uh, I spent 20 years in the military, as my good friend August uh, Fluger pointed out, our chairman pointed out. Uh, I know what war looks like. We're at war. I mean, uh, this is a war. Uh, it may be a cold war, but this is a war with China with the, the People's Republic of China every single day are invading Taiwan via their cyberspace. Uh, not only that, but the, the question I have for you is in particular, your, your expertise is in air. 
Uh, I spent five years as a uh, as an air crewman flying against China. I, I know exactly when they come out and they they uh, intercept our, our aircrafts. Uh, they're doing that every single day. And there's a danger in that, right? Because everything is fine until there is an accident, a spark, if you will, that turns a cold war into a hot war. Can you speak just to some of the dangers in which playing this game of chicken brings up, in particular, uh, to Taiwan? Absolutely. China has demonstrated uh, significant aggression in the air by penetrating Taiwanese airspace. Uh, and it, it is a violation of Taiwan's sovereignty. And also, when they're in the air, their professionalism is, is non-existent. Uh, they, they will, quote, dust us off, if you will. Uh, in one case, they, we had a collision, mid-air collision from one of their aircraft in, a, in, a, in an AVP-3. And, uh, and that is the nature of how they do business. And so what we can't do is watch them and let them get away with behavior like that and not do something back and not be there with Taiwan, not be present not be out there and, 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 uh, and make them respect us the way they are driving uh, fear into the Taiwanese with their, with their aggression. Uh, thank you for that. And uh, I, my next question is, is uh, uh, for you, Ms. Bingen, is um, uh, turning over to cyberspace. Uh, this, is the, this is what war looks like. That's the first aspect of it. And in cyberspace, there are no, there are no uh, uh, boundaries. There are no borders. We're all in on this together. And, and we also, you can't go it alone. You need to have allies. Uh, I put together a bill, the U.S.-Taiwan Advanced Research Act, that essentially creates a, a closer relationship in the cyberspace uh, with our allies. Can you just speak to that as far as how can we, how can the United States grow our relationships with others that let's say are not traditional relationships. You know, yes, we have our five eyes and we've got those those relationships that have had for a long time, but other places like Taiwan, what are your thoughts on growing that is in, in particular in the cyberspace? Well, Congressman, first, if I can go back to your Taiwan point and thank you very much for visiting. I had the chance to go there in January as well. Uh, and on, on Taiwan, if I can say, uh, the arming is, is incredibly important, giving them uh, a greater defensive capability. Uh, it includes not just the tangible weapon systems, but the training that goes along with it. And I think there's much more capacity there for increased training opportunities with our forces. Um, and the other point that you raised on Taiwan is um, every day they are in this cognitive disinformation war with, with China. And so that the more that we, with the CCP, so that the more that we can do to, to help them and, and highlight or create transparency around those disinformation campaigns is important. Um, on the cyber front, you're absolutely right on the allies. Um, you know, the, the, these are areas, and this ties back into China's Belt Road Initiative. They are doing a, a lot to try to get their infrastructure and make others more dependent on them. Where that leads to is um, other country, not, not only their ability to surveil and, and steal, steal data, um, but also they're advancing their techno-authoritarian norms and standards. So I think that there are things we can do on the international front, threat sharing, but also building norms much more akin to how we see the world and how we want the internet to, to be uh, operated, data to be protected than the Chinese model. I think it's, uh, I think it's very clear to point out that the, the People's Republic of China are the aggressor. Uh, you know, I, I, I spent I spent five years in Iraq and Afghanistan. Chairman Pfluger has also uh, been at war. I, I think it's safe to say we don't want war. We want to prevent a war. And part of that is showing that we're going to stand firm with our allies to prevent those. And uh, thank you, Chairman. I yield back. Gentleman yields. Chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Nevada, Ms. Titus. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, before I ask my specific question, I'd like to say that I agree too with Mr. Carrera and, and it also was uh, brought up by our last speaker that we need to do more. We don't do more by cutting the small foreign aid budget that we have in place now. We do more by investing more. You mentioned Belt and Road. You know, China is investing all across Africa. They're building ports in Lima. They just bailed out Sri Lanka. That's, you know, that's what we're up against. And if we walk away, uh, that's not going to be helpful in these difficult areas. But I, I want to ask you the question. We just heard this week about China saying that there, there's a potential conflict or confrontation if we don't put on the brakes. 
Now, I wonder just what that means for us. Does, is it an existential threat? Is it saber rattling? Is it nuclear war? What does that mean? How should we be gauging that? And what should we be doing in response besides shoring up Taiwan or you know, trying to make these investments that uh, seem to be fairly difficult to get people to support? Anybody? Uh, you know? Yeah. Or someone else start. I would say okay. the the narrative to the recent uh, statement by the Chinese minister uh, is a false narrative that we need to put on the brakes. We should start asking them to minimize the regression, right? Not only here in the U.S., but with our allies and, and, and friends around the world. I think the they're really great at putting us in the bucket as being the aggressors. And as we've heard from our... our or distinguished congressmen and congresswomen, that's not the case, right? And I think we as the United States uh, diplomatically have to do a better job, a more effective job of making sure the world knows that they are the aggressors. Because I think the narrative and they have a great uh, propaganda program as we heard, and they will use that to show us as the aggressors. Would, uh, General, would you uh, compare, how would you compare the threat by China to the threat internally, our homeland threat? Uh, by domestic terrorists that, compared to China, if we're looking at where our priorities would be. Well, ma'am, the, the, uh, the threat to the United States from China is the most grave threat we have faced in our lifetime, certainly since the Cold War. And the reason why is we have an economic superpower that's stealing our technology, that's leaping ahead on weapons that can strike us right here in the homeland, or deny our, our objectives overseas in defense of Taiwan. And if we let them continue at this pace and we don't answer that, we will find ourselves in a very uncomfortable position as Americans, which is watching U.S. service members lose fights. Mm -hmm. And so uh, to me, the, the existential threat posed by China and the, C and the, the CCP is an absolutely the, the largest threat to the U.S. and we have to realize it. And they're approaching us any seam they can find any way in. The balloon was a seam that they exploited. There's a hundred other seams that they've, that's they've been discussed here. I think it's time that we wake up. It's a Sputnik moment for us uh, here, and I think we need to realize that as, a, as an American society. Just continuing with this down the panel, uh, how about the CHIPS Act? We often hear that China's not the enemy, they're the competitor. Has this helped in any way to deal with the problem that we're now making chips at home instead of being so dependent on them economically? <coughs> One aspect on the CHIPS Act that I'd like to highlight is really the national security piece to it. When we look at, was it 80 plus percent of the world's chips, including everything that we use from commercial to, to, to uh, our, our weapon systems, um, you know, are, are manufactured within the first island chain. We've talked also here about the military threat. Um, we and, and, and the, the Taiwan's, you know, Taiwan Semiconductor uh, Facility, we need to look at building greater resiliency in our industrial bases and our manufacturing capacities. And so that, for me, was a big benefit of the CHIPS Act. Would you like to add to this conversation? Sure. To go, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Congresswoman. Um, to go back to your original question about um, the pathways by which we would be most likely to see Chinese aggression, it is my view that the most likely avenue would be over a Taiwan scenario. Um, if one thinks about how to deter that, there are two primary things in place that the United States has in our strategy. The first is a credible reassurance to Beijing that the status quo will not change, because if Beijing thinks that it is backed into a corner and has to choose either losing Taiwan or la launching a very risky and even low probability win war, it's quite possible one can imagine them choosing the latter. So that credible reassurance portion is important. The other por uh, portion of deterrence, which relates to the CHIPS Act, is the change in the balance of power. So another way in which deterrence could fail is if over time, shifts towards Beijing's favor in the probability that they would win a conflict would prompt them to act, even though the cost or the risk would be high. And that's why it's so important to ensure that the U.S. defense industrial base, through things like the CHIPS Act, uh, is, is closely protected. I, don't, I can't see a clock. Is my time up? I, I can't. See. Oh, that's well, just <laughs> real quickly. Is there anything specific we need to do next, like building off of the CHIPS Act, other than going on Codell's to Central America? Congressman, if I may, just amplify uh, the great comments here. I think on the Chips and Science Act, 
two things need to occur. More of that type of legislation that really uh, partners our U.S. government legislative body funding with U.S. corporate sector. Two, but the Chips and Science Act must be protected now. Uh, from ideation to development of new technologies, if we don't protect it, you're going to be having hearings in five years saying, how did all the technology from the Chips and Science Act get stolen and in the hands of Chinese? So two things can be true. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The lady's time has expired, and the chair now recognizes for the final question, uh, Mr. Crane. Um, General, this question is for you. Uh, a second ago, you were talking about how you were concerned about the age of the fleet. Is that correct? Um, and then also you were talking about uh, how China continues to steal our intellectual property. Is that correct as well? Um, how do we stop that, General? Well, the, the, the theft of internet, uh, intellectual property is something that probably goes beyond what I can comment on, but it, it, the step one is realizing that it's happening and ensuring not only the prime contractors, but the subcontractors that develop our defense systems have the appropriate resiliency and hardening. Um, the best way for us to counter China is to invest, you know, the, the investments the Department of Defense has made for the last 20 years to fight the, the wars we've been in are not necessarily the investments that are going to make us successful against dealing with a peer competitor like China. Uh, and so it's, it's important that we transform our investment to the areas that most concerns them, which is our ability to hold targets at risk in their homeland and our ability to deny them their objectives vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan. And so we can deter them through punishment and we can also deter them through denial. And it happens by investment in the department in the domains that are most critical facing a peer competitor, aerospace. Thank you, General. Uh, my next question is for Mr. Evanina. Uh, a moment ago, you were raving about the capabilities and dominance of the U.S. intelligence agency. I think that, you know, probably everybody up here would agree how impressive our intelligence agencies are and have been over the years. My question for you, sir, is are you aware of the lack of trust in our intelligence agencies by U.S. citizens? Congressman, yes, I am, and it's, it's a concerning issue. Yeah. Um, and you're aware that there is a select committee on the weaponization of the federal government up here right now? Yes, sir, I'm aware of that. You know, I represent some amazing people in Arizona, rural Arizona. They love this country. One of the most patriotic districts in Arizona. I myself am a Navy SEAL. I joined the Navy after 9-11 and I served for 13 years and I love this country. And I want our intelligence agencies to be strong. I think they need to be strong for a good reason. But I'm gonna tell you right now, sir, when, when, we, when we read years after the fact that you know, 50 former national intelligence folks, several heads of the CIA claim that the Hunter Biden laptop is rush, Russian dif, disinformation only to find out years later what we all, all knew that it wasn't. That's alarming to a lot of Americans. And it makes us lose trust in our intelligence agencies. And for me, when I look at a guy like you that's done everything that you've done, as intelligent as you are, I know that's gotta piss you off. If, if there were former Navy, if there were 50 former Navy SEALs out there lying to the American people, and we and I found out about it, that would piss me off because it it undermines the community that I hold so dear. And I'm sure you probably have a very similar endearment to your community. Am I correct in assuming that? You're correct, sir. What do you think we do about that, sir? How do you think we regain the trust with the American people and our intelligence agency? Congressman, I think you bring up a, a very a valid point that not only reaches the current events of uh, today with our intelligence and law enforcement community, but it also impacts the recruiting of future generations of women and men who want to serve in U.S. government intelligence and military apparatus. And I think that is the core element. I think two things have to happen. Number one, there has to be complete transparency of things that happened in the past, but more importantly, with the great things that the women and men are doing, we have to be more proactive in getting out to your district and other districts at the local level. And secondarily, there has to be some transparency of what's real and what's not real with the narrative reporting that we see in the media. And I think that's the obligation of law enforcement intelligence agencies to be forthwith of declassification and transparency of what's going on. Uh, real quick. Mr. Evanina, if it seemed like I was coming after you today, I apologize for that. It's nothing personal at all. I love this country. 
and I'm tired of I'm tired of losing faith and trust in the institutions and the organizations that as a little kid I had aspired to and I upheld and I know I'm speaking for a lot of Americans when I say that brother okay uh, last question I have real quick is for Miss Bingen. You said that war with China was not certain. Can you expound on that a little bit and please tell us all how we can, in your opinion, how we can avoid war with China? Thank you. Absolutely, Congressman. I, I, I wanna say that, that, that the cause isn't lost and there are things that we as a nation can proactively do. So for example, continuing to invest in a strong defense, ensuring our forces are ready is a signal and a deterrent making sure that we invest in resilience, resilient networks so that if the CCP decides to launch an attack, it will not, it will have a, a less effect on our networks and our infrastructure. Superior technology, former Secretary of Defense I worked for would always say, we never wanna send our sons and daughters into a fair fight. With the technology theft happening, we are very much at risk of sending our sons and daughters into a fair fight. So superior technology and agility in terms of how we use and use that technology. And then ensuring that we have um, a network of allies and partners. This is a weakness that the CCP has that we, we have. And, and sir, with all of your service, you know that we fight in coalitions and it's important to make sure that our allies are with us and partners are with us and not with China. Thank you, I yield back. And, uh, so we have some logistical changes here. The chairman had to step out. So um, I'm gonna ask unanimous consent from Ms. Jackson Lee to be recognized for five minutes. We're in, we're in trouble now. <laughs> we're both freshmen, so yeah, bear with us. All right. Uh, Unanimous consent for Ms. Jackson Lee. I recognize Ms. Jackson Lee. Well, to both of the chairman and the ranking member, I'm very pleased to be able to join you. And uh, from my perspective, you're two distinguished members of Congress, and thank you for your service. Thank you for your military service. Uh, before I start, um, I think because we're in Homeland Security, allow me just to put on the record um, that to be able to compete with China, uh, I think it is extremely important uh, that we uh, assert our democratic values, our values, the strength of our values, our competitiveness, uh, and uh, maybe we will have an opportunity to get the answer uh, to why, uh, I believe it public now, all of the personal data of so many Washingtonians, members of Congress, House and Senate have been breached. Uh, I don't believe that we have had uh, any determination of who breached it, uh, but uh, we certainly want to be on top of those elements, be they commercial or be they a foreign country, from uh, exposing private data of members of the House and Senate who have the responsibility of governing this nation. I wanted to put that on the committee's record because I'm incensed about it and hope that we will have some involvement ultimately in assessing that situation. But this is a very important hearing and I wanna begin uh, by uh, raising this question, and I'll have a second question, and I think, gentlemen, I will be finished. Um, but I want to uh, raise a question. Uh, Dr. Jones, uh, you have uh, described the evolution of the Chinese Communist Party's thinking when it comes to China's role around the world. We know that in recent years, the CCP has set its aims at developing China-centered and controlled global infrastructure, transportation, trade, and production networks. They tolerate uh, no a diversity when they go into countries. It is China, China, China. They don't even use the indigenous people. Um, and China is competing with the United States in a global competition over government values. We have to win the world over by saying that our values of trade and otherwise are much better than theirs. And so uh, how successful are China's efforts? What actions can the federal government take to outcompete the Chinese Communist Party? Frankly, I think we're nice. But I also think that if you interact with us, you'll have the benefits of investment in your own country and you'll have the benefits of long-term recovery. Many of you know that we passed the CHIPS Act, CHIPS and Science Act, close to my heart as a former member of the Science Committee, which invests $280 billion to increase domestic semiconductor production. I'm excited about that. Some of that may even come to Texas. Uh, unfortunately, not these gentlemen here, I don't think. Uh, that 90% uh, of our friends on the other side of the aisle did not vote for it, uh, but I know that they're probably working with it in their districts. So Dr. Jones, would you uh, share that with me? And I'd love to have um, uh, Ms. Uh, Bingham to answer that question as well. Dr. Jones, would you please? And Thank I'm you, Congresswoman. Looking at my 
Um, these are really excellent questions, and I thank you for them. Um, so you raised the issue of uh, difference in government values, and I, I agree. Although I should note that we do have some common interests, uh, if not common values. Um, China and the United States both want to see their populations uh, live prosperous lives, for example, uh, and both sides want to see um, the world address some of the challenges of global climate change. That being said, uh, it is very true that the two countries have stark differences in the way they see the relationship between state and society. Um, the protections that we have in the United States by which citizens uh, enjoy civil liberties and can organize against the state in order to keep its power in check are simply not present there. And it is true that China indiscriminately um, uh, or without uh, considering the types of behaviors that the target regime or the target state uh, is, is conducting, uh, will invest in it. And you mentioned the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, this is certainly one of the keystone portions of uh, China's efforts. Um, I do agree that um, the nature of the regime in that target country is quite important. We do have some research that suggests that uh, economic statecraft that China uses, for example, is less effective when the target country is democratic. And there's an intuitive logic there, of course, because if individuals just like in the United States can mobilize uh, against uh, their government, if they are in collusion with the Chinese Communist Party for illicit gain, um, they can hold them accountable. Um, and so I think that is a, it's, it's a mechanism by which we can indirectly uh, shape China's ability to use the Belt and Road in the way that you're describing. Congressman, if I can add, you, you mentioned it exactly right. China has a playbook that they're using with the Belt and Road. We've seen it, the, the ports, uh, 5G are examples, the ports where they go into countries, uh, Djibouti is a great example, where they go in, they operate the commercial port, they kick out the locals, they build up military infrastructure, and then it's, it's a greater threat to the region and to our national security interests. So we see that happening across the globe. Um, we as a government, I say formally, but um, the government needs to figure out how do they bring all their different tools of national power to the table to provide alternatives. Um, some of the areas we've been talking about today are on the technology front. Um, I have a space background. I would offer as an example, our commercial space innovation sector right now is phenomenal. Uh, we are using our space technologies, our data in ways be well beyond national security. Uh, understanding the climate, mapping, uh, countering illegal fishing. The, this is soft power for Americans uh, and for our companies. So ways that we can leverage some of these newer technologies while clearly protecting and ensuring that they don't fall into the, the hands of the CCP, but working with our allies and partners across the globe who want to work with us in these areas, um, figuring out ways to get that kind of information to them and opening up markets uh, for our businesses so they're not just relying on, on the U.S. government is also important. Let me thank you also very much. I think it's been established that the Belt and Road uh, technology or approach is uh, a danger to the framework of democracy of this nation. We need to use that power of our values and of course of our technology. I, I like commercial space uh, just because I'm a NASA aficionado and space exploration is uh, crucial. And Dr. Jones, uh, thank you for that framework that we can utilize. This is an important hearing, and I thank you, gentlemen, for yielding, and I yield back to uh, the chairman. Thank you, Ms. Jackson Lee. Um, I want to thank the witnesses for their valuable testimony and members for their question today. Also want to thank the members of the subcommittee um, that may have some additional questions and we may have some additional questions for the witnesses and we would ask the witnesses to respond to these in writing pursuant to committee rule 7d the hearing record will be open for 10 days without objection this subcommittee stands adjourned
The Committee on Homeland Security will be in order. Without objection, the Chair is authorized to declare the Committee in recess at any point. Good morning. Free and fair elections are the bedrock of our democracy. As we learned just over 18 months ago, democracy is not something we can take for granted. We must defend it fiercely and protect the institutions that uphold it. So I commend Chairman Thompson for allowing this important hearing on the threats to our elections. When I was first eligible to vote in 2006, election offices across the country were in the process of replacing infrastructure to defend against the greatest threat to elections in recent history, the notorious hanging chad. Social media was new and largely a way for young college kids to connect. Our adversaries had not figured out how to weaponize our freedom of speech or our technological ingenuity and use it against us. The notion that an armed crowd would descend upon the United States Capitol to disrupt the peaceful transfer of power would have been beyond anyone's wildest imagination. And harassing election officials to alter an election result was something relegated to developing democracies or democracies in decline. But the 2006 election ushered in a new era of threats to our democracy. The Russian government targeted election infrastructure and exploited social media to spread conspiracy theories to tip the scales in favor of one candidate and more devastatingly begin to sow doubt among the public about the integrity of our democratic institutions. Committee Democrats recognized the urgent national security threat the Russian government had created and established an election security task force with members of the House Administration Committee to better understand the threats to elections and how to mitigate against them. Unfortunately, we did not get bipartisan support to implement the task force's recommendations and efforts to enact them into law have languished in the Senate for two Congresses. In the meantime, our adversaries redoubled their efforts to sow division among us and some desperate politicians latched onto the big lie and other conspiracy theories. As a result, three days after I was sworn into my first term in Congress, a violent mob stormed the Capitol, holding democracy hostage. Outside Washington, election officials have found themselves victims of harassment and threats in a way that we've never seen before. As a result, election offices across the country are struggling to retain a trained staff exacerbating the existing challenges associated with administering the 2022 midterm elections. When we were sworn in as members of this chamber, we took an oath to protect and defend the Constitution and the democratic principles enshrined in it. It is incumbent upon all of us to understand the evolving threats to our elections and to defend against them. I look forward to the testimony today and I thank our witnesses for their participation. Before I recognize the ranking member on behalf of Chairman Thompson and the members of the committee, I would like to welcome Congresswoman Myra Flores of Texas to the panel. We look forward to working with you on important matters before this committee. The chair recognizes the ranking member of the full committee, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Katko, for an opening statement. Mr. Chairman, uh, you stole my thunder because I was going to welcome Myra Flores as well to, to Congress in general, but into the, for this committee in particular, given her proximity to the southwest border, her expertise in that regard will, will be a, a, definitely a value add to the committee. So I want to thank you for holding this hearing today, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate our witnesses being here to discuss how we can work together physically to physically protect our state and local election, election officials while also securing election infrastructure from foreign interference and cyber threats. The Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, or CISA, is charged by Congress with being the nation's lead civilian cybersecurity agency, and it plays a critical role in this endeavor. I look forward to our witnesses' perspectives on ways to improve the physical security of our elections, as well as the tools and services provided by CISA to shore up our election cyber defenses. They've come a long way for sure. Our committee remains committed to securing our democratically run elections from all threats, including physical threats to election workers. Following the 2020 presidential election, the Department of Justice reported more than 850 incidents of threats and harassment targeting election workers. Issues such as these will not be tolerated and can and should continue to be dealt with by local law enforcement. 
In recent years, foreign adversaries like Russia, Iran, and China have targeted U.S. elections both through election influence and election interference. Foreign actors seek to undermine our elections both directly by tampering with our election systems and indirectly by attempting to influence how people think about an election. Let me be clear, the United States will not allow any adversary to sow distrust or chaos in our democratic process. In addition to these foreign interference efforts, our nation is seeing a spike in cyber threats across all 16 critical infrastructure sectors, and the election infrastructure sector is no exception. Simply being vigilant is no longer enough. Today's cyber threat environment demands a posture of unwavering resilience. As we enter the 2022 elections, we must keep a keen eye on the midterms and ensure that voters can be confident that their vote will be cast securely. Given the volume and sophistication of the cyber threats we face, we must empower CISA with the tools and resources it needs to support our state and local election officials so that they can carry out their mission to administer free and fair elections. CISA's election security mission has greatly evolved since election infrastructure was designated as a subsector of our nation's critical infrastructure in 2017. CISA has gone to great lengths to build trusted relationships with state and local election officials across the country and has provided free and voluntary cybersecurity services, tools, and other guidance in all 50 states. A key part of securing election infrastructure that is owned and operated by state and local governments, not the federal government, is ensuring that CISA has the ability to provide situational awareness about vulnerabilities across digital footprints. I am pleased that we are joined today by Secretary LaRose, who as Ohio's Secretary of State serves as state's chief elections officer. The Secretary spent years working to ensure Ohio's elections are secure, and he was even named Legislator of the Year in 2016 by the Ohio Association of Election Officials for his work to improve the state's election process. I look forward to hearing from the Secretary and all our witnesses today about the practical, meaningful steps Congress can take to improve CISA's ability to support our state and local officials in protecting the cyber and physical security of our elections. Cybersecurity is indeed a team sport. And now is the time to double down. Protecting the homeland requires partnerships throughout all levels of government and across industries and party lines. Working together, we can be prepared not only for the threats of today, but also the emerging risks of tomorrow. And before I close briefly, I just want to give you one quick story. Several years ago, or two years ago, we had an election security task force meeting up in, uh, in central New York. And we have the election officials there from the counties in my district. And one woman told me that she received 1,762 directives from the election security task force in one year. She shares her chief information security officer with 20 something other agencies in her county and no one's digesting that information. That's one of the big concerns I have and that's one of the big things we need to tackle going forward is how do we make, how do we make actionable the information we're getting from uh, the experts. And that's something that we, I wanna hear from you, Ms. Howard and, and the other witnesses today. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back, thank you. Other members of the committee are reminded that under committee rules, opening statements may be submitted for the record. Members are also reminded that the committee will operate according to the guidelines laid out by the chairman and ranking member in our February 3rd, 2021 colloquy regarding remote procedures. I now welcome our panel of witnesses. Our first witness, the Honorable Maggie Toulouse Oliver, has served as the Secretary of State of New Mexico since 2016. From 2007 until 2016, Secretary Toluis Oliver served as the county clerk of Bernalillo County, where she oversaw elections in the state's largest county. Secretary Toluis Oliver is also the past president of the National Association of the Secretaries of State. Our, our second witness, Mr. Neil Kelly, is the current chairman of the Committee for Safe and Secure Elections. Mr. Kelly recently retired from serving as the chief election official, the registrar of voters for Orange County, California, a role he held for over 17 years. Mr. Kelly is also a past member of the EAC Voting System Standards Board, a past founding member of the DHS Election Security Task Force, Government Coordinating Council, and a number of other organizations aimed at making elections more accessible and secure. Our third witness, Ms. Elizabeth Howard, is a senior counsel for elections and government at the Brennan Center for Justice at NYU School of Law. Prior to joining the Brennan Center, Ms. Howard served as Deputy Commissioner for the Virginia Department of Elections, 
During her tenure, she coordinated many election administration modernization projects, including the adoption of online paperless absentee ballot applications, for which the department received a 2017 Innovations in American Government Bright Ideas Award from the Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation at the Harvard Kennedy School. Our final witness, the Honorable Frank LaRose, has served as the Secretary of State of Ohio since 2019. Prior, Secretary LaRose served two terms of the Ohio State Senate and was named the Legislator of the Year in 2016 by the Ohio Association of Election Officials in recognition of his support and commitment to improving Ohio's election process. Without objection, the witnesses' full statements will be included in the record. The chair asks each witness to summarize their statements for five minutes, beginning with Secretary Toulouse Oliver. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I am very pleased to be here today with uh, these distinguished colleagues. My name is Maggie Toulouse Oliver and I serve as New Mexico's Secretary of State, our Chief Elections Official. Election administration in the United States is conducted at the state, county, and local levels by civil servants who come to work every day to do their duty keeping the engine of our democracy running. This work is not glamorous, but it is vital to how we elect our leaders and how we organize our way of life. Since 2020, however, lies and misinformation about how elections are run and about the people who run them have proliferated to an unprecedented degree. Among a significant portion of the country, the continuous drumbeat of these lies has created an atmosphere of distrust in our elections and our election officials. Many people now believe that our country's highest office is occupied by an illegitimate president. Many people now believe that our entire election infrastructure is corrupted and has been weaponized to exclusively favor one political party. Many people now believe that election administration practices that serve to increase access and security, like secured ballot drop boxes, air-gapped vote counting systems, vote by mail, and the ministerial certification of election results, to name only a few, are part of a vast conspiracy meant to undermine our entire American way of life. Of course, these things are not true, and no one has ever produced a shred of credible evidence to support these conspiratorial claims. But the consequences of these lies have real world impacts, especially for election officials. For people who believe their government is corrupt and their leaders are not legitimate, threats of physical violence and acts of intimidation have unfortunately begun to seem like acceptable responses. In New Mexico, the conspiracies about our voting and election systems have gripped a portion of the electorate here and have caused people to take action. During the 2020 election cycle, I was doxxed and had to leave my home for weeks under state police protection. My office has since had to utilize services for both me and members of my staff that prevent doxxing by removing personal identifying information from the internet. Since 2020, my office has certainly seen an uptick in social media trolling, aggrieved emails and calls into our office and other communications that parrot the misinformation circulating widely in the national discourse. But more recently, especially since our June 22 primary election, my office has experienced pointed threats serious enough to be referred to law enforcement. As recently as June, for example, there were three threatening phone calls against me that were, were, for, excuse me, were referred to our FBI field office for investigation. These threats came on the heels of my office's effort to directly combat election misinformation through a new website and shortly after a nationally publicized situation in Otero County, New Mexico, where the county commission, parroting much of the election misinformation we're seeing across the country, initially refused to certify the primary election results. My office then had to seek a court order to compel them to perform their duty under the law. Growing distrust about our election system leads to either apathy or indignation, both of which will have detrimental effects on our entire system of government. For the election officials and volunteer poll workers that our elections depend on, I fear that threats coupled with the general vitriol online and in the media directed at all aspects of our elections will cause them so much stress and uncertainty that they will simply not want to do the work anymore. We've already seen this happening in many parts of the country. For voters, I fear that the flood of misinformation will compel them to lose more and more trust in the system and they will no longer participate in our democracy. I believe both federal and state law enforcement agencies are taking these threats seriously and diligently. We must show the public that threats against election officials will not be tolerated. Thank you again. I hope my testimony is helpful and I'm happy to answer any questions. 
Thank you for your testimony. The chair recognizes Mr. Kelly to summarize his statement for five minutes. Mr. Kelly? Yes, I'm sorry. Good morning, uh, Chairman Torres, Ranking Member Kako, and members of the Committee on Homeland Security. Thank you for the invitation to speak today at this important hearing. You rigged my election. We are going to try you and hang you. We are coming for you. There will be blood on the ballots and blood on you. These are just a small example of the type of threats and harassment election officials around the country have experienced, including myself, in recent elections. We also know that many election officials, in addition to personal threats, have also endured threats against their families. As a result, upcoming elections are not very appealing to those that run them. Many have left the profession. The impact is widespread. And while the effects on individuals are devastating, the potential blow to democracy should not be dismissed. Throughout my written testimony, I talk about the need to engage law enforcement in the election planning process. However, I must make clear that I'm not advocating for the presence of armed officers in polling places. This is a sensitive issue and one that should be handled with the seriousness that it deserves. I believe there are ways to address these growing threats while remaining steadfast in our resolve to recognize that the mere presence of law enforcement in the polls can be viewed as intimidation. There are steps that can help. As an example, while serving as Orange County's chief election official, I established a task force made up of DHS, the FBI, our state and local law enforcement partners, and our district attorney. Combining my experience as a former police officer, we worked collaboratively long before an election to plan for specific responses. This included local plain clothes investigators, pre-positioned in the field, not in polling places, reviews of all voting locations, personnel, and intelligence gathering. When we were faced with agitated observers, threats, and protests in 2020, the coordinated response was swift and effective. Amid these growing threats, I believe that we should not lose sight that elections are critical infrastructure, as mentioned by Ranking Member Kotko, which was established to support and protect the mechanics of running elections. The protection of our nation's poll workers, voters, physical locations, ballot counting centers, and voting systems, which are a part of the backbone of our democracy, should be a priority. I'd like to try and thread a needle here. I feel it's important to highlight the very essential right to observe and comment on elections, to be a part of the process, and to engage with your local election administrator. I believe in the fundamental rights that the First Amendment affords our citizens as they exercise their rights to challenge the outcome of an election. Transparency goes hand in hand with a fully audited, accurate, and fair election. These are not mutually exclusive. Nevertheless, as an election official, you know when that line has been crossed when acts of violence, threats to oneself or family, threats to the infrastructure, interference, harassment, or intimidation begins to emerge, then the entire process is at risk. Over the past several months, a group of election officials and law enforcement personnel from across the country have been meeting to address the protection of the public servants who supervise our elections from intimidation, threats, and violence. Recently organized is the Committee for Safe and Secure Elections, of which I'm currently the chair, I mentioned at the outset, it's a group of chiefs of police, elected sheriffs, and former and current election officials nationwide coming together to close the gap between law enforcement and election administration. Our committee is focused on creating tools and developing solutions to combat this problem, such as resources, guides, and training for law enforcement and election officials, creating tools designed to build relationships among partner agencies, and looking at potential policies that might help to reduce the risk. I don't want to leave this important topic without also noting that we must continue to do work to reduce voters' lack of confidence, which can exacerbate the very issues we are discussing today. For instance, election officials should continue to expand audits, partner with prosecutors on any violations of election law, and improve the voter experience, which will continue to build trust and confidence among voters. This, of course, will not change all hearts and minds, but this is a journey without a finish line. Congress can greatly assist states and counties with these growing threats by raising awareness, increasing funding to enhance physical security of election offices, the associated infrastructure, and supporting collaboration among election officials and law enforcement partners when needed and most appropriate. Finally, in closing, 
Our institutes of democracy are under attack, and while many election officials are resilient, it is stretching their capacity to, create, to operate while being threatened. I don't mean to overstate this, but the important act of running fair and accurate elections is what holds a fragile democracy together. We just want someone to have our backs. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you for your testimony. The chair recognizes Ms. Howard to summarize her statement for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Torres, Ranking Member Kako, and members of this committee for the opportunity to speak with you today about the ever-changing election security landscape and one of the biggest concerns facing our elections today, threats against election officials. As you know, in 2017, state and local election officials were somewhat suddenly informed about the threats against our election infrastructure by foreign enemies, such as Russia and Iran, and about the types of attacks that they were now responsible for protecting our election infrastructure against. Despite being underfunded and under-resourced, our election officials are rising to the challenge. And just five years later, there has been a remarkable improvement in the resiliency of our election infrastructure. Today, election officials view cybersecurity as a critical component of planning for safe and secure elections. New and more secure voting equipment has been deployed across many states and many counties. Election officials have developed and practiced plans to respond to various cyber threats, such as ransomware. And many officials have taken other important steps to harden their systems against cyber attack. This significant shift would not have happened without the federal financial support specifically designated for election security that Congress has provided starting in 2018, and the federal partners, including the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency and the U.S. Election Assistance Commission that have worked closely with our election officials over the past five years. Also critical to the significant improvements that we see today are the election community leaders who have led by example, including the three other witnesses on today's panel. Ohio Secretary of State, of State LaRose has long been a pioneer on the election and cybersecurity front, working to quickly and strategically secure Ohio's election infrastructure against attack and establishing some of the first statewide standards in the country. New Mexico Secretary of State Toulouse Oliver has also served as an important election security leader. She was one of the first to quickly distribute the initial tranche of federal election security funding to those most in need in her state county election officials. Neil Kelly, who as a local election official was primarily responsible for administering elections, published one of the first practical election security resources for officials, the 2018 Election Security Playbook. And while we are now on the right track to secure our election infrastructure against cyber attack, new and different threats, many with domestic roots have arisen, including threats of physical harm to our election officials their families, and their staff. You will effing pay for your effing lying, effing remarks. We will take you out. F you, F your family, F your life, you effer. Watch your effing back. Threats like that left as a voicemail for a Republican election official in Michigan were received by election officials across the country after the 2020 election and continue today. Not surprisingly, these threats are leading to additional serious concerns, such as an alarming number of election officials leaving the profession, which are contributing to the fragility of our democracy. Just as they needed your help to protect our technology, election officials now need your help to keep them, their families, and their staff safe. In the Brennan Center's 2022 election official survey, we found that more than three-fourths of election officials believe that threats against them had increased in recent years. More than half were concerned about the safety of their colleagues, and one in six election officials had been threatened. Effective mitigation strategies will require tackling not only these threats, but also the barrage of false information about our election administration and our election officials that is fueling these threats. Of course, Congress alone cannot eliminate these problems. A proper response will require a whole of society approach, and we all have a role to play. However, Congress can play a primary role in tackling these issues and spurring on others to do their part. For example, Congress should authorize grants specifically for physical safety training and for security enhancements to election officials' residences. 
Congress should also work with a number of federal departments and agencies to ensure that they are effectively working to protect our election officials, including the Departments of Homeland Security and Justice, as I have detailed in my written testimony. Thank you again for your time today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you for your testimony. The chair recognizes Secretary LaRose to summarize the statement for five minutes. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you so much, Chairman Torres and uh, Ranking Member Katko, and really all the members of the House Homeland Security Committee. Thanks for the opportunity to submit my testimony today on the security of our elections, of course, something that we all care deeply about. First, let me set the scene for you. It's May 4th, 2021. It's primary election day in Ohio, and an individual has plugged an unauthorized laptop into a government network at the Lake County Administrative Building. He was engaging in some sort of effort to capture election data. Presumably his hope was that he was going to discover uh, or download some sort of election uh, information to prove that election results can be impacted by an outside influence. I'm happy to report that that person failed and he failed miserably. Why? Quite simply because we were prepared. Now, when I served as an Army Green Beret in the, in the Special Forces, we learned to never let our guard down. Our lives were a constant churn of study and preparation and execution. After all, the bad guys only had to be right once. We had to be right every single day. Uh, when I was elected Secretary of State, I took that same mindset and adapted it to how we operate in Ohio. In fact, we made it our standard. So how did we stop this perpetrator on primary election day in 2021? It actually started in 2019. When I was uh, when I issued as Secretary of State our first ever security directive for all of Ohio's 88 county boards of elections, it was a checklist. I called it our pre-flight checklist for the presidential election of 2020. It was a 34-point checklist of both physical and cybersecurity requirements that were designed with one purpose: to keep the bad guys out. Now, I'll be honest, when I first announced these requirements at a meeting of all of our county boards of elections, there was a groan in the audience and even some laughter in the back. I was asking a lot of them and many thought that it wasn't possible, but our elections are too important and we can't sit on our hands and hope that things are going to be okay. We have to take action. And that's exactly what our county boards of elections did. From the most populous and sophisticated county boards of elections in our state to the most rural county boards of elections that have been really administering elections the same way for generations. They all rolled up their sleeves and in concert with the security professionals in our office, they got it done. That's why Ohio's bipartisan teams of elections professionals, in my opinion, are truly the best in the business. So when this individual plugged his laptop into a Lake County administrative building, what did, what did he access? Quite simply, nothing. First of all, every single county board of elections computer system has long been siloed off from every other county office. So anyone thinking that they could use a county computer system in one county office to somehow infiltrate the county board of elections would find that they would run into an impenetrable brick wall. Second, even if they had somehow gotten into the board of elections building and, and plugged into their network, they would have immediately been blocked because that computer would have been recognized as an unauthorized user on that network. Again, game over. Uh, these are just two out of dozens of improvements that we made at our county boards of elections since 2019. Naturally, when we talk about cybersecurity, we're talking primarily about those elements of election infrastructure, which are, of course, connected to the internet. We're talking about email, websites, polling location lookup functions, uh, online voter registration, all conveniences that voters, of course, uh, want to have access to. But it's important to emphasize that voting equipment is never connected to the internet. There's an entire separate parallel set of election infrastructure that is never connected to the internet. Quite simply, anything that touches a ballot can never be connected to the internet. That's scanners, voting machines, tabulators, all of which are very strictly air-gapped. Since our first directive, we've issued two more. Again, we can never get complacent or rest on our, our laurels. Uh, with the most recent one just announced last month, we call it our Security Directive 3.0. As the tactics of our enemies change and evolve, we must do the same. That's why we can't rest and we, we won't rest. A comprehensive, multifaceted security strategy within our county boards of elections is necessary to provide the redundancy required for a strong election system infrastructure. 
We also know that our, we also know that our elections are only as successful as the people who run them. In 2020, we recruited a small army of dedicated patriots, Republicans and Democrats to serve as poll workers. In the face of uncertainty amid the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, we had a record 56,789 Ohioans who stepped up, were trained and ready to serve their communities, and they provided secure, accurate and accessible elections, the ones which Ohio voters have, of course, become accustomed. In light of the pandemic, we knew that we had to get creative about poll worker recruitment. That's exactly what we did. We worked with a whole array of professionals and all sorts of different demographics to recruit patriotic Ohioans from across the state to help us administer an incredibly challenging election. In doing so, uh, we stood up also an army of truth tellers who could speak firsthand about the lengths to which Ohio goes to ensure the integrity of our elections. You simply can't put a price on that. Integrity matters. That's what our elections are built on. Thomas Jefferson put it uh, very succinctly. Secretary LaRose, if you can conclude. Powers. Yes, sir. Uh, government uh, derives its just powers from the consent of the governed. And the only way that we convey that is through a free and fair election. And that's what we're going to continue to deliver in Ohio. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Look forward to your questions. No, thank you, uh, Secretary LaRose. Um, I thank the witnesses for their testimony. The chair reminds each member that he or she will have five minutes to question the witnesses. I will now recognize myself for questions. Uh, Ms. Howard, you know, threats to election security vary widely in the United States. There's the threat of a cyber attack on election infrastructure. Uh, there's the threat of influence operations that radicalize people with misinformation and disinformation and malinformation. And then there's the threat of violence and harassment and intimidation against election officials themselves. Of all these threats, which one, in your view, has the greatest likelihood of endangering election security in the 2020 congressional midterm elections? 2022, I apologize. Thank you for the question. Um, right now, one of my biggest concerns has to do with threats against election officials, not just because of the threats against the election officials, but because of the cascading effects that result from these threats to election officials. So what we're seeing across the country are election officials who are deciding to leave the profession. So for example, five out of um, Arizona's 15 counties now have new um, election directors this cycle. Six of Georgia's most populous counties have new election directors this cycle. Um, this creates the potential for more mis- and disinformation because the people taking the retiring election officials place are not going to have the same level of experience. They're not going to know as much and they're not going to be as um, as prepared as as those who had several years of experience who were running election elections in their state and their county to combat right this ever growing threat of mis dis and malinformation. Ms. Howard, you noted that one in six election officials have been the target of threats. Uh, we heard from Secretary Oliver and Mr. Kelly that they themselves have been the targets of threats. And we know that former President Trump's uh, narrative of a stolen election inspired the Stop the Steal movement, which ultimately led to the insurrection on January 6th. My question is for Mr. Kelly and Secretary Oliver. You know, to what extent, based on your own experience, are the words and ideas of former President Donald Trump uh, at fault for creating what seems to be an unprecedented hostile environment against election officials? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the question. I will say this, that although uh, these types of, of discourse were amplified in 2020, I've heard them before. Uh, if you go back to 2018 in Orange County, uh, there, was, there was a number of similar threats and, and uh, issues that arose when we had congressional districts flip from red to blue. Um, we received very similar uh, public statements from local elected officials. So it's not just at the national level, it can certainly happen at the local level, we see that. And I will say this, it's not just in battleground states or contested uh, uh, contests, it, it is across the country. Um, so while I think it certainly had an effect, uh, I've seen it before. Secretary Oliver. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I certainly agree with my colleague, Mr. Kelly. Um, but as you noted in my introduction, I've been an election official at the local and state level now for almost 16 years. So of course, in every single election, we see rumors, we see mis- and disinformation. Typically, once we as election officials are able to clarify uh, any questions about how the election is conducted and, and provide the public or accusers with information, those rumors tend to peter out. 
Um, unfortunately, we are still on a daily basis uh, in my state and across the country uh, living with the reverberating effects of the big lie from 2020. The recent activities that happened in my state where we almost failed to certify an entire county's worth of votes in a primary election are a direct result of that rhetoric. Um, and as we all know, when it comes to leadership, you know what you say from the very highest echelons of government power in this country do have those reverberating effects. Um, and, and so yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, they, they are impactful and they continue to be impactful on a daily basis in this work. Ms. Howard, the DOJ task force, um, there's a DOJ task force aimed at confronting threats against election workers. It's received well over a thousand reports of threats, but has only secured one conviction which raises the question why only one conviction is is the issue one of law that the law is insufficiently protective of election board workers or is it one of enforcement what is your assessment of what's going on there so the doj task force um, has taken important steps but clearly what they've done is not enough um, we have a couple of recommendations specifically for the doj task force um, we think that they need to expand the task force to include state and local law enforcement um, as our Brennan Center survey showed, almost nine out of 10 election officials who had been threatened reported those threats not to federal officials, but to their local law enforcement. DOJ needs to bring them to the table um, to help combat this serious threat. And just before I conclude, um, do you think federal law is sufficiently protective of election workers? I think there are improvements to be made. Okay. I will now recognize the gentleman from New York, the ranking member for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, again, I want to recognize Ms. Flores. We've recognized her before she got here, but welcome to the committee and welcome to Congress. Uh, Mr. Uh, LaRose, uh, I, I spoke in my opening statement at the end about my concern about the local election officials being able to digest uh, the vast amount of election security information that they're given. And I, you know, I want to ask you just briefly, can you tell me uh, what you think about uh, what we can do to make that more digestible for the locals? Uh, the information is no good and the security directors are no good if the locals cannot digest it. So I want to make a comment on that for me a second. Well, thank you so much, Ranking Member Katko. And, you know, it kind of reminds me of my time in the military where we had a saying that, uh, you know what, rolls downhill because somebody's bright idea at the at the top ultimately comes down to a sergeant or a private that has to implement it. And, and oftentimes there's a lot that they have to deal with other than, than those kind of directions that are coming from a headquarters somewhere. But we've tried to be knowledgeable about that when we deal with our county boards of elections. Now, of course, I issue directives. I have to do that in order to coordinate the way our county boards of elections operate. But it's important to remember that they are the folks on the ground doing the implementing of all of these things that you're telling them to do. And often that means that they're focused on a variety of, of, of different things. And so um, we also need to recognize that our boards of elections, at least in Ohio, and I'm sure this is the case around the country, reflect the great diversity of our country. I have boards of elections where it's two people that work in the courthouse basement. They're purposeful and dutiful about their work, but it's just them to run that county boards of elect board of elections. I've got county boards of elections that are 150 people uh, with a you know very large and sophisticated staff. And so it's important for us to remember the men and women on the ground, these bipartisan groups that are doing the work of running elections. Uh, we can't throw too much at them. We have to prioritize what really matters. That, that I understand, but how do we fix it? I understand the problem. Yeah, and again, it's us being mindful, right? It, it, it's, it means that uh, myself as a state administrator, the other 49 that do this work need to be uh, knowledgeable about what we're telling them to do, but it also means that we need to uh, be very careful. You all need to be very careful about uh, not sending down uh, directives or, or, or passing uh, laws that would create federal standards uh, that may be unattainable as well. One of the other things is uh, far too many times the, the funding that comes is appreciated, but there are so many strings attached that the work that it takes to comply with all of the different standards attached to that funding uh, make the, the, the dollars um, much less useful because you spend so much time uh, filling out the forms to justify how you're spending the dollars. Thank you, Mr. Rose. Ms. Howard? Yes, sir, thank you for the question. Um, I would say that the concerns that you're raising are at the opposite end of the spectrum of the concerns. Um, when I was an election official again in 2017, at the beginning of 2018, when we weren't receiving sufficient right. information. 
Um, right from zero to 60, right? Now exactly, we got to figure out how to digest exactly. it, right? Um, so I, I think that federal officials and CISA officials in particular have recognized that they are trying to calibrate the amount and the quality of information that is being provided to our local election officials. Um, CISA representatives at multiple meetings that I've attended with election officials proactively asked for feedback about, again, the quantity and quality of the content that they're receiving. Um, I think CISA, this is a, you know, an ongoing work is required and CISA is, um, you know, working to do this. So they need to continue to listen to the election official community about what is helpful and what is not. Thank you very much. And, uh... Miss um, Oliver, I, I, I understand your testimony and I credit your testimony about what generated some of the personal threats against election care workers, but I also appreciate the candid testimony of Mr. Kelly that it comes from a variety of different sources, not just one. And I think we need to keep that in mind going forward. Election security, I think, and a lot of the problems with election security are generated, it seems like to me, from uh, the internet and the ability of cowards to hide, hide behind the internet and foment discontent online and then make that discontent actionable by nut jobs locally. And that's one of my concerns. And so if any of you uh, uh, want, to, want to address that, Mr. Kelly, maybe uh, want to address uh, how we can better uh, I try and find and anticipate the threats before they happen. Uh, and it's, that's finding the proverbial needle in a haystack. But what, what do you think, sir? Thank you, Ranking Member Kako. I think it's a great question. And I will tell you that uh, work that I've done with our local law enforcement fusion center in Orange County uh, went a long way with that because the intelligence gathering on the ground is really important. And identifying individuals on social media that might be uh, spreading disinformation, misinformation, but not only that, may have uh, represented potential signs that they could be triggered into some sort of violent act or something uh, along the lines of threats. And I think that that intelligence gathering is critical to reducing the risk up front. Thank you, you'll back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I will now recognize the gentleman from Rhode Island, uh, Mr. Langerman, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you. Very good. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing. I want to thank our witnesses for their testimony today. Um, as we all know, there's no such thing as uh, perfect cybersecurity. I've said that many times myself, uh, including in our election systems. As such, we should expect that vulnerabilities will continue to be discovered within our election infrastructure moving forward. Yet, uh, amidst a, a climate of rampant disinformation and outrageous lies about election security, I do fear that a responsible uh, disclosure of and communication about cybersecurity vulnerabilities in election infrastructure is becoming more and more challenging. So uh, not all vulnerabilities, of course, will be equal in their severity or ease of exploitation, but their very existence could be manipulated to undermine uh, public confidence in the integrity of election infrastructure and, by consequence, uh, the outcome of an election itself. So to all of our witnesses, our questions are, uh, how are state and local election officials thinking about communicating to the public about cybersecurity vulnerabilities in election systems in a way that preserves trust uh, in those uh, those systems. And also, how can elements of the federal government, such as CISA, lend their support? And uh, are there opportunities here for congressional action that help, help address this challenge as well? Well, Congressman, I'll start, I suppose, if I may. Um, in Ohio, we were the first state in the country to implement what's called a vulnerability disclosure policy. Effectively, we were asking the good guys, the white hat hackers, to find all, find wherever we had a vulnerability and let us know about it. That's resulted in dozens of um, fixes that we've made. We found where our errors were and we fixed them. Uh, one thing, though, that that that, uh, that I've struggled with and, and have wanted maybe some more help from the federal government on is being able to share our successes. Um, when things go wrong, the public generally will know about it pretty quickly. Uh, but we haven't always been able to share our successes, and the public should know uh, when we had a day where good guys won and the bad guys lost. Um, oftentimes that means uh, as quickly as possible declassifying what can be declassified without, of course, jeopardizing sources or methods, uh, but uh, giving us the chance to tell the stories of where we stopped the bad guys is something I'd like to be able to do more of. Thank you. Thank you. 
Yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, Member uh, Lingvin, I agree exactly with what my colleague from Ohio just said. Um, I will say that you know, when I first came into the Secretary of State's office in uh, late 2016, um, obviously we had just gone through an election where um, m many election officials across the country were not aware of what the federal government was aware of. Um, and I think there's been a tremendous amount of work done uh, along working alongside CISA and DHS, um, the work that the Government Coordinating Council uh, has done to try to figure out what is the right balance. Um, obviously, we want to be aware as soon as possible um, as chief election officials of any potential vulnerabilities. We want to address them immediately. We need that information yesterday, not tomorrow. Um, I will say that I feel like the federal government has done a much better job about quickly uh, declassifying or relaying uh, appropriate directives to our offices. We're getting so much better about sharing that information with each other, but it is a delicate balance because we wanna make sure once we've identified a vulnerability and that we have a plan to fix it, to fix it quickly, um, and that it is going to get the job done. And so a lot of the work we do is that very careful balance. Uh, we do need to make the public aware. That's incredibly important, but we also need to make sure we have those plans in place. Thank you. And as a former Secretary of State myself, I understand the, the particular challenges that uh, that you all have. So thank you for the work you're doing. Uh, let me shift to since uh, before my time has expired, um, uh, if Ms. Uh, Ms. Howard, uh, if I could, in your testimony, you noted that despite uh, federal efforts to make grant funding for programs such as uh, Burn Justice Assist Grant Program available for election security, none of these funds have yet been used for such purposes and that election officials in at least one state have already had their request for grant burn uh, JAG uh, funding denied. Could you uh, and other witnesses uh, uh, with your insights here um, uh, speak to some of the difficulties that election officials are experiencing in the application process uh, for these grants and you know uh, is there more the Department of Justice can do uh, or other departments administering the election security grants could do to help uh, to get this money out uh, and if so, is the opportunity for congressional action here too? Thank you for the question. Um, yes, there are uh, now available to election officials are Homeland uh, Grant Security Program funds. Um, just recently, the Department of Homeland Security reinstated election security as a priority. Um, however, that prioritization was not accompanied with a minimum spend of those grants on election security. And what's, what election officials are seeing um, and are concerned about is the fact that their needs are going to be deprioritized. Um, these funds are not new, and many of the... Um, Ms. Howard, I'm going to have to interrupt because we're 30 minutes, 30 seconds over. Um, I have to recognize the gentleman from Mississippi, uh, Mr. Guest, for five minutes. I apologize. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Secretary LaRose, uh, our Constitution, as you're well aware, gives individual states uh, the rights to conduct uh, their own elections. Uh, this is a central pillar of our government that federal authorities, uh, I believe, must not infringe upon. Uh, and so uh, my question, uh, very broad in nature, is uh, what can Congress do to make sure that we are providing a secure electoral system uh, without uh, direct interference from the federal government in a, in a process uh, that I believe uh, that our founding fathers rightfully intended to be controlled at a local and state level. Thank you for the question, Congressman. I should say I enjoy working with uh, your Secretary of State uh, through our National Association. Uh, you're right. There are 50 different ways of running elections throughout this country. That decentralized nature of the way we run elections is not a bug. It's a feature in the way that American elections are organized, and it goes back to our very founding. It must be protected. Uh, as you're well aware, though, the federal government has some resources that states just candidly do not have. Uh, and that's why I think that it's important to continue providing those resources. CISA is just one great example of that. It's, it's uh, I found it to be a very positive working relationship that we have with them. Uh, and then you know, to resist the temptation, of course, uh, to tinker, uh, for the federal government to start intervening and telling states how to run elections. Uh, I, I do think it's good for states to develop best practices and share those with other states. Candidly, I've worked to share some of the things that we do in Ohio so that other states can learn from them because we've been under the national spotlight for many years in Ohio. 
Um, but uh, for the federal government to start mandating the way states run elections is uh, a bridge too far, in my opinion. Uh, I, I would say humbly stick to helping us do our jobs better instead of telling us how to do them. Uh, and Mr. Secretary, uh, you, you do mention about uh, federal mandates uh, and recently legislation uh, introduced uh, in the House, actually passed out of the House. And two of the things that were in that legislation as it relates to voting, two things that I find very troubling. Uh, one uh, is it would do away with voter identification uh, when individuals go to the polling place with an attempt to cast uh, their, uh, their votes uh, and would also require same day voter registration. Uh, I know that Ohio is a state that does require uh, advanced registration, as does my state of Mississippi, uh, and also requires uh, voters uh, to present an ID when they are uh, showing up and doing in-person voting. So can you, can you talk just a little about, about the importance of uh, having individuals uh, make sure that they are registered at some period of time before the election, uh, and then also the, the importance of voter ID in the integrity process as we're looking at making sure that elections are both fair uh, and that, uh, that, that individuals trust the outcome of those elections. Well, yeah, thank you, Congressman. It's about finding that balance. Um, I reject this notion, and some offer this idea that somehow you have to choose from either convenient elections or secure elections. I think that's a false choice. In Ohio, we have elections that are both convenient and secure. It is easy to vote, and it is hard to cheat in the Buckeye State. I know that's the case in many other states as well, but these are policies that we have developed that work in our state, uh, that fit the, uh, the the makeup of our state, and it may not work in, in other states and, and other geographies. Um, for example, as you mentioned, uh, our state constitution requires people to register to vote 30 days before the election. Uh, I think it would be a, a, a very bad thing for the federal government to ignore what our state constitution says and mandate same-day voter registration, for example. Um, proving that a voter is who they say they are is an important thing. And we do that in Ohio through mandatory photo ID. If you don't have it, you can produce alternative forms of identification because we don't want to leave anyone out of the process. But we do want to know who voters are uh, when they turn up to vote and to make sure that they're actually registered voters. And so uh, these are just important common sense safeguards. They work for Ohio. They work for Mississippi. Uh, if you don't like it in your state, then, then you work with your state legislature to make those changes. Um, th that's the best place to make election law is at the state legislative level. And, and, uh, and I think we should stick with that. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, last question, uh, Ms. Howard. I saw in your testimony, uh, it looks like on page seven of your written testimony, uh, you talk about the need for uh, there to be funding for security upgrades on the homes of election workers. Uh, kind of curious as to who that would include, uh, possible funding mechanisms, costs that would be associated. Are you talking about election commissioners? Are you talking about poll workers? Who would be eligible for these home security upgrades? Thank you so much for the question. Um, as you heard earlier in Secretary Toulouse's um, opening remarks, she had to leave her home. Um, I'm aware of other election officials who've had to leave their home, and I'm aware of election officials who have had local law enforcement do assessments of the physical security at their homes when they are under threat. Um, some of these election officials simply cannot afford to make the recommended security enhancements to their homes. Um, I think that certainly that this should at minimum cover election officials, so the primary election officials at the local level responsible for administering our elections. Thank you, Ms. Howard. Did you uh, I'm actually, Thank you, Mr. The gentleman's time has expired. Um, I, I will now recognize the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Payne, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you uh, for holding this um, hearing and to the ranking member. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Kelly, you mentioned in your testimony that after 2016, DHS enhanced its relationships with the state and local election officials on cybersecurity, but there has not been uh, as much engagement in, in the physical security. Has that changed since 2020, the 2020 election? And how can DHS better partner with state and local governments on physical security concerns and enhanced information sharing? Thank you, Congressman, for the question. I will say that it, I believe it certainly has improved. Uh, I, I want to give uh, public props to DHS because 
I took advantage of their services that they had to offer. It's like a shopping cart of services. And uh, that goes a long way to increasing the physical security of our buildings and the physical security of our vote centers. Uh, and I will say that I'm seeing more of that being done across the country by my colleagues uh, than has been the case in 2016. And DHS continues to roll out additional products and services that I think are very valuable uh, for use. So thank you. Thank you. Um, this is for all the witnesses. And Ms. Howard's testimony, she explained that many election officials are leaving their positions because of their increase in threats, potentially leaving elections to be run by uh, inexperienced workers. For all, all witness, can you um, elaborate on the value of ex experienced election workers in providing an efficient and secure election process and what type of problems may occur if we are forced to rely on inexperienced workforce? How can we better retain election workers in today's environment? Anyone can start. Well, Congressman, I'd be happy to start with that. Uh, we recognize, of course, how important experience is. In fact, what I did when I came into this office is created a mentorship program where new election officials, staff, members of the boards of elections can be partnered with someone from their party, uh, from a similar size, county uh, board of elections and, and and benefit from their experience so that mentorship has really been a great program in ohio and a lot of people are benefiting from it but you're right uh we have uh, challenges recruiting and, and retaining election officials uh, those paid full-time staff and it's not just yes. of course that's a big deal but it's beyond that it's also just the burnout of the constant churn of the work that they're having to deal with And Congressman, I would just add that I think as we continue to professionalize uh, this industry, we're going to see additional retention uh, as more election officials have resources that they can rely upon and feel that that they have their that people have their back. I think you're going to see more retention across the country. No. Sir, I would just also add. I'll keep you up for one second, um, Ms. Howard. Um, whoever, please mute if you are participating virtually. We need you to mute. I'm sorry, Ms. Howard. Thank you, sir. Um, I would also add that the typical election official, local, the typical local election official um, makes about $50,000 a year. Um, and the reality is that these jobs, as Secretary LaRose hinted at, are, are unrelenting. Um, our election officials, unlike many of us, don't have the luxury of getting an extension, regardless of whether a child is having an important moment, a graduation, regardless of whether a loved one or themselves is sick. Um, I will note that my, um, that Neil Kelly, who is also here today in 2020, was in the hospital with COVID and he continued working because there is no extension. There are no excuses when you're an election official. So I think that there are a lot of steps that we can take to help support them, fully staff their offices and pay them for the work that they do. I, I thank the witnesses for those answers, and Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I will now recognize the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Bishop. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to start off consistent with the spirit of this hearing and say, uh, I think all elected officials and everybody in our country ought to condemn threats. And even to the part of what Ms. Howard read, uh, even profane kind of uh, vehemence directed against election officials and everybody else. I mean, I, we've seen in recent weeks uh, the same sort of invective and threats and even an assassination attempt directed against the United States Supreme Court justices. Uh, I, so I, and sometimes there seems to be some selectivity in terms of the way officials respond and, and in fact, official responses. So we had the controversy last year with the Department of Justice issuing a, a, a memorandum about law nationwide activity concerning threats against school board officials, it sort of turned out to be not so many threats, but, but even some harsh rhetoric. And, and yet, maybe we haven't seen that kind of reaction in the case of election officials, and, and perhaps we should. We shouldn't see officials uh, confronted and condemned and hectored and so forth at restaurants. So I think that that should be said across the board. Um, let me, uh, 
Let, let me ask you, I guess, Ms. Howard, quickly, do you agree with that? Uh, yes, I think that political violence is a problem and that we should condemn threats against our election officials. And, and, and other officials, wouldn't you agree? Yes, sir. S Secretary Oliver, um, I, I noted uh, a few weeks ago that the Wisconsin Supreme Court held that ballot drop boxes are uh, illegal under that state's law. And um, you spoke about uh, the reasons for distrust and you attributed them to, uh, I've used the term big lie, and of course that has a lot of currency. But isn't it, I mean, there's no recourse for it, but isn't it true by implication that ballots cast in Wisconsin by absentee drop box deposited ballots were illegal in the 2020 election? Um, Congressman, thank you for the question. You know, I, I cannot speak to the ins and outs of the specific legality, uh, the, con the constitutional questions that came forth in Wisconsin. Uh, what I can tell you is that in states like mine, where we have secure 24 hour monitored systems that are permissible under state law, uh, we do not see the level of uh, concern and and frankly, the, the, the alleged fraud um, that, you know, has been leveled against such ballot collection systems. Well, right. um, so it's, I'm sorry, Mr. It's yeah. sort of independent, Secretary Oliver, with whether it's legal or, or excuse me, or whether it's a, a good policy or bad policy. And I'm not trying to attribute one or the other. Uh, I, I'm just trying to say there, there, were, there were a variety of things that contributed to a, an atmosphere of distrust about the election, one of which were allegations leveled that things were done illegally in certain places, and at least in the, and I'm using the Wisconsin case as an example, uh, that, that turns out to have been validated at least by a later holding by the Supreme Court, doesn't it? Um, you know, Congressman, I think the challenge is that uh, if we continue to litigate uh, election law um, after an election has already been certified, after people have already been installed in office. I think this is one of the big challenges that we're dealing with. Now, whether Wisconsin can continue to use secure monitor containers or not, of course, is at the discretion of the Wisconsin Supreme Court and the lawmakers there in that state. Well, um, it certainly doesn't affect, in retrospect, the outcome of the election and the certification of that election. Well, I, I get you. I, I just think that the use of procedures that are illegal uh, as executive officials improvising on the election law, which was a big part of the controversy in 2020. Now you see, I mean, again, I, I agree. Once the election's done, there's no point in relitigating. I mean, you can't, literally can't. But the determination uh, that, that, that it was illegal, I think, has some implications for people make. So I'm not sure you can then level against people who make comment on that subject responsibility for, for uh, tr distrust in elections. It's a shared responsibility at worst. Let, let me ask quickly to Ms. Howard. Uh, in North Carolina, we've got a situation where the partisan board of elections, as I say, we've got a partisan majority. Brennan Center, in fact, advocated for that when that was litigated in North Carolina, just voted 3-2 to kick the Green Party off the ballot. It's a Democrat-dominated board, um, and they did it over a, an issue concerning uh, signatures, allegedly. Um, but they've, the same board recently said they refused to uh, verify signatures on ballot applications. And I wonder, doesn't that sort of inconsistency uh, breed distrust? And isn't a, a partisan board's majority, a partisan split rejection of a party from the ballot, doesn't that undermine uh, trust in elections and election officials? Ms. Howard, time has expired, but please answer as concisely as you can. Thank you for the question. I, I don't have the details about that vote or those actions, um, and I will talk to my colleagues that might be more familiar with it and get back to you with information. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like uh, unanimous consent to submit a, an article uh, uh, from the Carolina Journal dated July 5th, uh, 15, uh, titled Lawsuit Links Governor's Office to Effort Blocking Green Party from Ballot. Without objection. I will now recognize the gentlewoman from New York, uh, Ms. Clark, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning to everyone. And thanks to all of our witnesses for joining us today to discuss changing the election security landscape. Before I begin, I'd like to just offer my well wishes to our chairman and friend, the gentleman from Mississippi, Mr. Thompson. We wish him a speedy recovery, a full and complete recovery, and hope to see him soon. I thank the chairman and ranking member for calling this hearing to address threats against 
election officials and infrastructure. This is an issue that I myself and other members of this committee have raised for a number of years. And the importance of addressing this now has only been underscored by the excellent work done by the January 6th Select Committee. Protecting the safety of the folks responsible for carrying out our most sacred democratic processes, our local election officials and election workers is of paramount importance. Recognizing this, CISA provides a number of voluntary physical security assessments and trainings that can help local election officials enhance their, juris their jurisdiction security. Secretary uh, Toulouse, uh, Oliver, uh, excuse me, Secretary Toulouse Oliver and Mr. Kelly, how effective are CISA's programs on physical election security and what additional assistance from CISA would be most beneficial uh, to uh, you and uh, individuals in your capacity? And then finally, how can CISA's role be expanded to better states and local governments strengthen their physical election security posture. Thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, first and foremost, I just want to say that CISA and DHS have been absolutely incredible partners with uh, election officials like me around the country for the last several years. Um, primarily, of course, for several years on the cybersecurity front, but here in my state, and I know in many other, if not most other states across the nation, we also take advantage of the physical security uh, tools and resources that are provided to us. Um, I think that, you know, the very first piece of that puzzle is to conduct these assessments. Um, we have been working together in my state, and I know many others have, to conduct those assessments because without assessing the situation, we don't know exactly what we need. Uh, in order to keep our poll workers safe and our voters safe uh, out in the field uh, and our election officials as well. Um, so I think, you know, like everything we've been doing on the cybersecurity front and the physical security front, as we go through elections and as we continue to see what we need and what circumstances we are dealing with, uh, CISA has been able to develop and adapt and improve those resources that are available to us. Um, I don't have a specific recommendation at this point other than uh, we should continue that work, CISA should continue that work in, in uh, partnership with our offices. And as has already been mentioned today, you know, funding uh, is critical. You know, elections are critical, national infrastructure, uh, and a state like mine, uh, it goes a little bit, goes a very long way for us to be able to secure our election environment. Very well, Mr. Kelly, anything you'd like to add? Thank you, Congresswoman. I'll, I'll keep it brief. I agree definitely with what Secretary Oliver has said uh, about the services. Just very quickly on the on the ground, I have a 200,000 square foot campus that I was responsible for in Orange County. And since the DHS came in and did a very detailed assessment on that and identified dozens of areas where we could improve physical security. And the one thing that I would add is that improving from CISA the use of the same assessments for our vote centers and those that work in the vote centers would be very critical and important. Thank you both. Ms. Howard, in your testimony, you call for Congress to find to fund efforts to develop and conduct online safety training. Can you elaborate on how you see this program operating? So election officials personal information is often available online. Um, and there are consultants who can provide training and information about how to protect your personal information, how to protect against doxing. Um, and there are services that where they can go out and proactively assist the election official with pulling down and taking down that information and scrubbing it. Um, there are a variety of steps that election officials can take and uh, putting together a training that provides a checklist for election officials just about common sense um, practices that they can implement on their own would, would be a step in the right direction. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I will now recognize the gentlewoman from Iowa, Ms. Miller Meeks. Thank you, Chair Torres, and I thank uh, all of our witnesses and ranking member for conducting this hearing. Uh, Iowa, over the past four years, has passed election integrity laws, uh, and each time we've passed a law, we've seen record numbers of people show up at the polls to vote or uh, to vote absentee after an absentee ballot request. So we're finding that people's confidence in the election system uh, does affect their uh, willingness to turn out to vote. So it's an extraordinarily important topic. 
Uh, Secretary LaRose, you recently confronted the challenge of non-government entities, the Voter Participation Center and the Center for Voter Information spreading election misinformation in your state. The duo sent false unsolicited mailings and confused voters. How are you combating this threat to your state's election? Yeah, thank you so much, Congresswoman. Uh, th the simple matter is that it's been done with information, being accurate information out to the people of Ohio. But this concern first came to us from our county boards of elections in a bipartisan way. They were getting concerned phone calls uh, from voters that said they were receiving uh, multiple uh, of these forms that were addressed to people that had not lived at that residence for many years or were deceased. Uh, so the real problem with these organizations is that they were using bad data. Of course, there's nothing wrong with getting voter registration forms out or with getting absentee ballot request forms out to make it easier for people to request their absentee ballot, which, of course, we allow in Ohio at, at, for any voter that wants to vote absentee. Uh, the problem was this or, these organizations just did shoddy work, and it really confused voters. Uh, we've encouraged organizations like this, if they want to engage in some sort of a uh, you know, absentee ballot request drive or whatever else, work with us to make sure you've got good data and you're using the right kind of forms and that kind of thing. And certainly we know that voter rolls and voter lists are not clean uh, to that point. Um, it also appears that Ohio, like Iowa, is facing a shortage in election workers. One news article claimed that a, a county in your state has 551 workers but needs 846. Um, do you believe that this is a threat to your state's election integrity? And if so, what, if anything, can Congress or the federal government do to help states facing these challenges? Yeah, thank you. And to the last question, we work really hard at maintaining accurate voter lists. These groups were using lists from years ago, and that was part of the real problem. Uh, poll worker recruitment, it's like, um, it's like hygiene, like brushing your teeth. We've got to do it every day, right? And so this is something we've really focused on. I'm happy to report that for this uh, unusual August 2nd primary that Ohio has to hold for our state legislative races, we're actually seeing strong numbers of poll worker recruiting. Uh, we've implemented all of these creative programs where we've worked with barbers shops and beauty salons and uh, the lawyers in the state to get continuing education credit, other professionals like realtors and librarians as well. So we've really worked hard on poll worker recruitment. The fact is you can't open 4,000 polling locations across the state of Ohio unless you've got 40,000 poll workers to staff them. Uh, thank you for that. Um, and also after the 2016 election, and I think we've heard part of this um, already by some of the other witnesses, state and local affection of, uh, officials felt frustrated by the lack of coordination from the federal government by not providing enough details regarding the Russian activity and how to respond. Learning from this, both CISA and the FBI changed their policies regarding incident notification and now notify chief state election officials when a cyber e incident occurs in a locality in their state. Some have previously expressed the need for required reporting of election cyber incidents to CISA and the FBI. Can you briefly discuss why this may be necessary? Yeah, we need to know things so that we can act quickly. And that's the bottom line is when it comes to protecting our elections, time is of the essence. Elections occur on this routine schedule and the next election is always just right around the corner. Or we may even be in the midst of conducting an election. So time is always of the essence. Uh, I can tell you where CISA and FBI have vastly improved this is making sure that their state election officials, the secretaries of state in most cases, are immediately notified. If it's a county board of elections that has vulnerability or a problem, uh, of course that county Board of Elections needs to know, but we as their state partner also need to know immediately. Thankfully, th those processes have been improved, but there's always room to continue to improve that. Again, a notification on a Friday night or a Saturday morning will result in action right then. We're not going to wait until everybody comes back to work on Monday morning, and that's why these things are so timely and crucial. You know, we found the same thing in Iowa and um, utilizing the resources this is providing to us going to do a roundtable, which includes our election officials in it, as well as education and businesses. Thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you, uh, Chair Torres. I yield back my time. I will now recognize the gentlewoman from New Jersey, uh, Ms. Watson, Ms. Watson Coleman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the witnesses. I want to follow up on um, Representative Miller Reed's question. Um, what is it that we, what, First of all, let me just say to you, Mr. Lewis, I hope you're sharing information that has been successful for you all in Ohio with the rest of the secretaries of state around the country. 
I hope that you're connected in such a way that they benefit from some of this information because it doesn't seem that you're experiencing the same kind of issues that we seem to be hearing about in other places. And so, um, Secretary of State Oliver, uh, what do we need to do to be able to recruit um, poll workers, new election um, officers? How do we ensure them that they are going to be safe and supported? What is it that the federal government needs to do to be able to help you all do uh, what you need to do to ensure we have enough? And we have the appropriate um, folks working either election day or even in, you know, in the offices in general. And then I'd like to have Ms. Howard respond to that question as well. Thank you, Congresswoman. First and foremost, uh, Secretary LaRose is one of our most active partners at the national level. Uh, he and I are both very active in our National Association of Secretaries of State, which is uh, recently uh, has started to be helmed by your Secretary of State, Madam Congresswoman, which we're very excited about. We do share best practices with each other. But to your question, um, I think we have already, we've seen uh, some signaling both from CISA, DHS, and our other federal law enforcement partners uh, and the DOJ FBI task force that election officials at all levels, the security, uh, is, a, is a national priority. Um, that needs to continue to be a drumbeat and it needs to continue to get louder using all of the platforms that the federal government has available to it uh, to make folks aware. In terms of recruitment, um, you know, I, I think when I grew up, uh, you know, serving as a poll official, working the polls, you know, that was uh, a, a typically considered civic duty, uh, a, a sense of volunteerism and community. Um, was instilled, and I think we've kind of gotten away from that. And I think the more we can do at all levels of government to send the message that being a part of the election process, particularly if you're somebody who has questions or concerns about the integrity of our election process, is a wonderful way not only to serve your community and to be a good uh, public citizen, but it's also a way to make sure that our elections have integrity. So I'd love to see more public information uh, by all the various platforms we have available to us. Thank you. Um, Ms. Howard, I particularly want to know about the resources that are necessary uh, to ensure that the protections that need to exist um, locally, that, we're, that they're available, that election workers and uh, poll workers in particular recognize that there is this system that's got their back, and to what extent are our local enforcement and state enforcement agencies uh, participating and recognizing the need to be engaged uh, robustly? and particularly in this next election and preparing for the one after. Thank you so much for the question. And I, I would highlight the Committee for Safe and Secure Elections, which is chaired by Neil Kelly and supported by the Brennan Center and other organizations that is working closely um, with uh, state and local law enforcement and state and local election officials to address many of the um, concerns that you've highlighted. Uh, I will also say that election officials um, have reported some of them have reported struggling to access some of the federal grant funds that are available for election security. So as we talked about earlier, the Homeland Security Grant Program, um, election security was recently uh, reinstated as a priority area. However, um, there, unlike other area, unlike other priority areas, there is not a minimum spend on election security. Um, it's a, a similar issue with the JAG burn funds. Um, which are available to help um, better protect election officials. Uh, there is no minimum spend on election security. And what many election officials have reported is they are struggling to actually obtain access for a variety of reasons, um, including the timing of the grant cycle, the notification of when they are identified as a priority area, um, and, and other issues um, that, uh, you know, we believe that requiring a minimum um, for election security will, will alleviate many of those concerns and will help get the federal funding to the election officials that need it. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I will now recognize uh, the gentlewoman from Tennessee, Ms. Harshbarger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank you to the witnesses for being here today. Um, I do have a question for Secretary LaRose. Um, 
I know that Ohio did a great job in 2020 with election integrity, and the not every state did as well as Ohio, okay? I live in Tennessee, and I think we did a pretty good job. But you spoke about your security directive 3.0 to protect elections in Ohio. Could you explain um, this measure and how states could implement this in a successful manner to have secure elections? Yeah, absolutely. And thank you so much, Congresswoman. Uh, this built, of course, on our first executive and our second security directive. So this is just the third iteration in these checklists that we're giving. This one's a 31 point checklist that we're giving our county boards of elections. We're giving them a few months to get this done and bringing some funding to the table. Uh, what we did is put really strict new standards in place for vendors. Our election officials rely on a lot of vendors. And if they're not secure, then that could harm the integrity of our process as well. Uh, stronger uh, physical security requirements, working with DHS to do physical security audits. If you've got the best cybersecurity in the world, but your server closet is left propped open or unlocked, then uh, then that's not going to help you too much. Uh, better vulnerability disclosure and specifically requiring vulnerability disclosure for our vendors uh, so that they can leverage the power of the private sector of the ethical hackers out there to find where things are wrong. And then, of course, also prohibiting election equipment provided by foreign vendors that are on the restricted list that the federal government uh, maintains. Uh, these are just some of the things that we're doing. Uh, you can talk about uh, several other items as well, uh, like better vulnerability scans that are being put in place, but uh, those are the, the highlights. Yeah, tell me about that vulnerability scan. I read that and I'm like, tell me how this works. Yeah, so what we're doing now is requiring the boards of elections to let the, uh, the vulnerability scanners inside the door. It's like a home inspection. If you are buying a new home and the home inspector can only look at the outside of the home, and yeah, they're going to find a few things, a roof or whatever else. But if you actually let them into the basement, if you let them go up in the attic, that's when they're really going to find uh, if the house is in good shape or not. And so this new vulnerability scan that we're requiring the boards of elections to do uh, brings the, 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 the folks that are doing those inside so they can get inside of the systems and, and really take a deeper look at what's going on in them. Well, makes sense to me. I'd certainly want to look at my basement or my attic uh, if I had an issue with my home. Now, you talk about cybersecurity efforts, uh, and can you tell me a little bit about what you're doing in Ohio? Because with that security directive, looks like you're requiring local elected officials to include, or election officials to include cybersecurity terms in their contracts. Absolutely, and that's how we enforce it with vendors. Right, so when, when our uh, boards of elections engage in a contract with the vendor, um, in many cases, these are boilerplate contracts that have been used for many years. We're now requiring them to include cybersecurity terms in that contract. And the simple fact is, if you can't abide by those terms, then you can't contract with the County Board of Elections in Ohio. You've gotta be able to live up to the terms of that contract. So that's just another step that we're taking, uh, again, to make sure that these vendors that our boards of elections are so reliant on can meet the cybersecurity standards that we've set for our boards. You know, you hear about things and I heard when I went to Nashville and talked to the legislators, uh, I think the early part of the year, there was a problem in one of the counties with the Dominion machine that every six vote it kicked out and they, they caught that because more people showed up to vote than there were votes. So, you know, there has to be measures in place in any state and in every county to make sure that uh, there's no question about the integrity of any election. And, uh, you know, that 31 point checklist, that's something I would like to take a look at, honestly, make sure that we're doing that in Tennessee or anything that we could make uh, do with and implement. I know that my county where I live in went to paper ballots this year and you have to show your driver's license, paper ballot, it all has to match up. And, you know, that ensures safe elections in my opinion. Okay, I thank you for that and the, I'll yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, I will now recognize uh, the gentlewoman from Florida, Ms. Demings. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, to all of our witnesses, every uh, one of you, thank you for your testimony today, but also thank you for what you are willing to do under what has grown to be unbelievable challenging circumstances. Thank you for protecting our democracy. I think we all know, or we should know, 
regardless of what state, what your home state is, that every person deserves to be able to cast their vote and have their uh, vote counted. I've heard, um, Mr. Kelly, I believe you said you're a former law enforcement officer, and I've also uh, heard Ms. LaRose, you're a former Army Green Beret. Mm -hmm. uh, we thank you for that service, but I certainly hope that's not the new criteria uh, these days for election uh, workers. The, the, your testimony has been so valuable, but believe me, it's been quite painful. Uh, Mr. Kelly, you talked about um, that the level of threats, violent, crazy, unbelievable threats has been amplified uh, after 2020. Uh, as a 27 year law enforcement officer who certainly had an opportunity to interact with a lot of election workers, I have never heard the stories um, during my time uh, that I've heard since uh, 2020. You said it's the threats have been amplified. I think that's such a politically correct way of putting it. Um, but I, I would like to hear uh, from you again uh, in that particular area, as well as every witness. Well, no, as a matter of fact, let me start. Um, Ms. Oliver, um, amplified in 2020, but uh, you've seen it before. That's what Mr. Kelly said, but you've seen it before. Uh, could you just talk about a little bit what you've seen before uh, 2020 compared to post 2020, please, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Congresswoman. So uh, in my experience, again, uh, in almost 16 years of conducting and overseeing elections, first of all, I think every elected official at every level in this country uh, knows what it is to have someone uh, harass you, um, make, you know, even general threats against you. Um, sometimes individuals, particularly those with mental health issues, get fixated on election officials um, and, and from time to time, you know, there are concerns about our personal safety. I don't know a single elected official that hasn't gone through something like that. Um, however, in my personal experience, uh, the, the level of vitriol, uh, the, spe the specificity of threats, again, having my personal private information doxxed uh, and having to fear for my own personal safety and the safety of my family, uh, at home during the holidays. Um, those are things that I, I have never personally experienced in my role as an election official. So I would say it has been amplified significantly since 2020 in my personal thank experience. Thank you so much. Mr. LaRose, uh, thank you for the job you're doing in Ohio. Uh, could you answer that question for me, please? Yeah, Congressman, uh, Congresswoman, my experience is, uh, is slightly more limited. I've only been the Secretary of State since 2019. You're right that there have been uh, a lot of folks that have gotten too emotionally exercised about elections administration. I, I spoke to our election officials conference last year, and what I said to them is that, of course, elections are political. Every aspect of, of campaigning is, but elections administration must not be politicized. I think that should be our focus. The nuts and bolts of how we run elections and count the votes and report the results, let's stop politicizing that. Keep the politics for the campaigns. Ms. Howard. Thank you for the question. Um, I served in a, as an election official from 2014 to 2018, and I don't ever recall receiving a threat in that period just for doing my job. Um, however, as you've heard from many election officials, um, that's, uh, that's just not the reality today. Many election officials across the country in red states and blue states and red counties and blue counties, purple counties, um, are now receiving credible death threats. Thank you. Mr. Kelly, I'll end with you. You also talked about that you're not advocating for armed officers, uh, yet people are receiving threats to their families, their own personal safety, just for protecting our elections. Um, could you talk a little bit about what you are advocating in terms of working more closely with law enforcement to protect um, the integrity of our elections? Thank you, Congresswoman, for the question, and uh, and I think it's a great one. I, I think that uh, there's a couple things that could be done. First of all, law enforcement in many cases is unaware that issues on election day or leading up to the election can be a real threat or a real issue. Not in all cases, but in some. And I found that beat officers, officers on the ground, uh, just are not familiar with criminal codes for election violations or that threats to election officials uh, are occurring in large numbers. And so awareness is very critical. 
very quickly when I was in Orange County, uh, I had police officers respond to some scenes and they just thought it was a civil matter. They were not aware that there were actually criminal violations that occurred at a vote center. So yes, making Mr. them- Mr. Aware, Kelly, I'm gonna actually have to, your, the time has expired. Um, I will now recognize for five minutes um, the gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Flores, and welcome to the committee. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman and Ranking Member for holding this hearing today. Despite recent claims to the contrary, our country has record high of voter uh, turnout. Given this, we must ensure those who are voting are legally permitted to and able to easily continue to do so. Our role in securing safe, fair, and free elections should be prioritized, making it easy to vote and hard to cheat. I wanna thank all our poll watchers and all our election officials for all the work that they do. We must condemn all threats against our election officials. I um, I know what it's like to be there and I just um, can't imagine what uh, they're going through. And I believe that we must provide them with the resources and the funds so they can do their job more uh, effectively. Uh, despite remarks by the administration implying that Hispanic Americans don't know how to use the internet and therefore are incapable of exercising their right to vote, I can speak firsthand about both uh, willingness and the capacity of my community and the Hispanic community around the country to make their voices heard. Uh, voter security, it is a national security, and I am thankful to all the witnesses for taking the time to speak with us here uh, this morning. Uh, if I may ask, uh, Mr. Kelly, thank you for being here this morning. Um, can you talk about the physical safety of election workers and officials specifically in Orange, Orange County? Uh, thank you very much for the question. And yes, ma'am, I, I absolutely can. I think vote center employees, as we call them in Orange County, or poll workers, uh, the safety and security of them is, is paramount in what we do in every election. There are a number of things that we can do to increase the protections. For instance, plainclothes officers in the field ready to respond very quickly to incidents at, at polling places. Training that can help our vote center supervisors de-escalate issues. Uh, is very important, but I can tell you that we were focused on security for those vote center locations and our poll workers and keeping them a priority because they are the backbone of how we operate and uh, it's very important that we protect them. Thank you. Um, Secretary LaRose, uh, thank you for being here this morning. I know it has been, uh, I know it has been talked about um, already this morning, but can you go uh, further into details about the organizations such as the Voter Participation Center sending out false information in Ohio and what steps is uh, your office taking to stop this and other groups from spreading misinformation? Yeah, thank you so much, Congresswoman. Uh, appreciate the question. Uh, as, as I was starting to say earlier, uh, it, it's really about public information. The voters deserve to know where their trusted source for elections information is. That's why we're constantly promoting. Go to the official .gov website that your Secretary of State or your County Board of Elections operates. In our case, it's voteohio.gov. Uh, that's where we want people to make sure that they're getting their trusted source of accurate information. Um, but as it relates to, to false information in general, listen, the best antidote to lies is truth and lots of it. And so we work to make sure that Ohioans have access to that accurate information. We partner with community organizations from the diverse communities throughout Ohio to make sure that we get accurate information out there. Social media is another one. And so uh, these are all part of the efforts that really every Secretary of State engages in so that voters know how to vote uh, and uh, and they know that they can trust their vote in the Buckeye State at least. And that's something that, uh, that we're proud of. Uh, thank you for your testimony. I yield my back, my time back. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I will now recognize the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Malinowski, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thanks to all of our witnesses for the work that you do. Um, I, I want to start with you, Mr. LaRose, and, and say at the outset, I, I was very impressed by your testimony and by the work that you are doing in Ohio to protect the physical integrity of our elections, but also then to defend the integrity of our elections against uh, all of the misinformation that's out there. Um, that said, I, it seems we've still got a very, very big problem in terms of public perception. Um, when something like 
Forty percent of Americans uh, believe that the 2020 election was stolen. Um, about 60 to 70 percent of Republicans. I saw a poll uh, that suggested uh, in Ohio, 62 percent of uh, Republican primary voters in 2022 uh, believed that the 2020 election was stolen. Um, I, I, I trust you agree with me. That's a very dangerous phenomenon. I mean, if I were to believe that a presidential election were stolen, um, I would be losing faith in my democracy and the system of government in our country. Um, clearly, that is the, the root cause of the threats of violence that many uh, nonpartisan election officials across the country are, are facing. So I, I guess my question for you is what, what more needs to be done? What should uh, elected officials, responsible leaders in our country be doing to, um, to address that false belief out there and to restore the confidence of all Americans in that, that our elections have integrity. Well, thank you, Congressman. And, and you know, in some ways, I, I guess I find the silver lining to every cloud. Uh, the fact is that folks are interested in this topic right now at a level they wouldn't normally be. And so I view this as an opportunity to educate people about the safeguards that exist. Um, and uh, to make sure that that information is available in all parts of our state. I'll give you a couple examples. We've worked with our county boards of elections and had them set up uh, booths at their county fair where people can come and, and vote on their favorite deep fried fair food or whatever. That's just the hook to get people to come over because when they do, they'll see a voting machine and they may be inclined to say, well, hey, is this the one with the secret foreign algorithm in it? And instead of laughing at that person, it's a chance to engage with them. And now, teach them that, that voting machines are never connected to the internet. They're tested before each election, audited after each election, et cetera. We've worked with, uh, again, the diverse communities from throughout the state to, to help empower those community leaders to be sources of accurate information about election integrity. And you know what? We've put out the challenge. If you believe that there are big problems in our elections, sign up to be a poll worker. Put your money where your mouth is. Spend the, the long day of doing this work. Uh, what we found is that when people do that, they come out of the experience saying, you know what? elections uh, are run honestly and, and reported accurately. I, I, those are just a few ideas and, and, and those are things that we're doing here in Ohio. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. And, and, and you know, I'm sure you also agree just very simply, all of us as public officials just need to tell the truth about, about our elections because when we don't, it, it um, encourages uh, our constituents to, to lose confidence. Um, Ms. Oliver, um, uh, you know, we've heard a lot about what happened in New Mexico. I, I, I assume that a lot of the lies and misinformation that, that led to those threats uh, were spreading on, on the internet, uh, on social media platforms. Uh, I, I often say that the, the big lie is the virus, but Facebook is the wind. And it, it's, it's not just that these things appear on the internet, it's that the large online platforms um, do write these algorithms that, uh, that basically connect every single person with a propensity to believe in conspiracy theories with conspiracy theories. Um, if, uh, if, if you're on the right, it will push you further right. If you're on the left, it will push you further left. Um, the, the, these companies design their networks in a way that encourages the spread of information that makes us angry at each other, that increases our divisions from one another. Um, so I, I, I see you nodding, so I assume something that, that you agree with. Uh, we, we are, uh, a number of us are working uh, in Congress on legislation that uh, would hold these social media platforms more accountable uh, for the way in which they amplify and recommend information to, uh, to the American people uh, to, uh, to deal with, with these kinds of threats. Is that something that you think would be helpful? Absolutely, Congressman. Thank you. I, I think that's a worthy effort. And I think, you know, just among my Secretary of State colleagues, uh, you know, I, I think we all share that concern, right? Both the mis and disinformation from the right and the mis and disinformation from the left. Uh, and in fact, what we know for a fact, when we all started heavily engaging in this cybersecurity work about five years ago, um, was that, you know, foreign entities, uh, particularly Russia, Iran, et cetera, were taking advantage of, uh, of those divisions. Um, and I'm gonna, so, I'm gonna have to uh, interject. I apologize for. Um, I want to recognize the gentleman from Texas for five mis minutes, Mr. Fluker. No, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to all the witnesses for your time today. Nothing is more important 
and a secure uh, election with integrity. We are and we should be setting the standard, the gold standard around the world. Uh, Secretary LaRose, you talked about how you stopped the perpetrator in 2021 and how that work really began in 2019 with good preparation. And I think that's key. So what are what actions are states uh, or the federal government currently not taking right now um, that prevent us and protect uh, any threats in the future, two, four, five, six years from now? Thank you, Congressman. Of course, the threat's constantly emerging. The bad guys are um, are always coming up with creative new ways to do things, and that's why we can't work. Uh, one step that all states should take that we've taken in Ohio is that your chief elections officer should have a uh, CISO, a chief information security officer, somebody who focuses solely uh, on that work of cybersecurity. You should have a vulnerability disclosure policy if you don't already. If there's a hole in your fence, you need to know about it. And the vulnerability disclosure policy is a way to do just that. Um, again, there are a lot of other things like Albert sensors that are available from uh, our partners with DHS. If you don't have those at your county boards of elections, you should do that. That allows for that remote monitoring. So again, if something goes wrong, on a Saturday morning or a Friday night in the middle of the weekend, you can know about it before everybody comes back to work on Monday and you can mitigate the problem right then and there. Those are just a few of the steps, but again, it's about constantly, uh, it's about constantly monitoring emerging threats and that's why our partnership with CISA is so crucial. Well, thank you for taking those steps and ensuring that we do have faith in the system and uh, whether it's real or perceived, um, we, we have to get to a point where we have faith in our election system. Ms. Oliver, it's uh, disturbing to read. Thank you for your 16 years of work. And it's really disturbing to hear your testimony, to read about the doxing, to hear about the threats. Um, that should never happen. Um, and, and we should all, as elected officials, and as was eloquently mentioned, um, condemn that. And I, I'm interested to hear, you know, not just how that made you feel, but how does it make you feel to now see Supreme Court justices being doxed and in, in groups uh, encouraging people to go to restaurants and intimidate those uh, individuals. Thank you, Congressman. You know, violence has no place in our democracy. Threats of violence and harassment um, are, are really undermine our democracy. And, and frankly, it doesn't matter which party, what, what level of public official, um, I think we're seeing this become more prevalent. Um, and so that's deeply concerning because as it becomes more prevalent, more individuals who may be inclined to engage in such behavior uh, are, are looking at these examples and saying, well, if these folks are doing it, uh, we should engage in that too. It might push folks over the edge to engage. Uh, it, it has no place in democracy, period, uh, no matter who we're talking about. You're right. It's very disturbing to see those that will not condemn those actions that won't hold people accountable for trying to use the force, the threat of force or any sort of intimidation uh, and uh, deserving to hear your testimony. Thank you very much. Mr. Kelly, I'm uh, interested in your thoughts on, you know, just the verification and knowing who is who, running a good election uh, system and, and understanding and, and how uh, important it is to verify who's voting. Do you believe that it's, uh, it should be a requirement to, to verify uh, those who are voting uh, in your elections, and would you like to see that centralized at the federal level? Thank you, Congressman, for the question. Uh, of course, I was operating under California law, which uh, did not allow for identification uh, to be presented in person. And and so, I, as an election official, uh, I, I can kind of see the, the value in that in terms of uh, showing your ID, just like when you fly on an aircraft, uh, probably wouldn't be a bad idea to show at a polling place. but. That's above my pay grade and, and, a, and a policy discussion that uh, election officials shouldn't be making. Well, Mr. Kelly, I think it's um, incumbent upon all of us. I mean, this is a good hearing for us to come together as experts in the field, you guys as experts, us asking the questions. But, um, I, you know, I find it hard to believe. I mean, those that are getting into the Capitol, they most likely have to provide an ID to get into the Capitol building to verify who they are. Um, and yet in states, you know, if, if we're not able to verify, I think, your voice matters. And, and I would say it's, it's actually, um, you know, not above your pay grade. You're, you are the expert in this and, and need to be, uh, you know, advocating for those policies. So um, I think it's, it, I find it hard to, uh, to look at some of the federal policies and proposals that are coming forward um, to, to say that we maybe don't need to have an ID. We don't need to show who we are. We don't need to 
uh, prove that the system and give what my colleague on the other side of the aisle just said, which is the perception of a good system that has integrity and character. I know I'm past my time. So thank you uh, to all the witnesses with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I will now recognize the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Meyer for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you to our witnesses who are here today. Um, you know, I think something that has come up in a lot of the questions and, and, and testimonies that public trust and confidence um, in our elections is essential. And I think we also saw in the 2020 election that that hinges strongly on having quick and accurate results. You know, the longer it takes for results to be reported, uh, the more time that is spent on that count. Uh, it allows the room for doubt, disinformation, and conspiracy theories to multiply uh, that then further degrades public faith in our elections. Uh, Secretary LaRose, you know, there are several steps that stakes can take to make sure those election results are reported quickly and accurately, including the pre-processing of absentee ballots, um, encouraging early in-person voting. If someone is not uh, present to vote in person on election day, can you describe what steps Ohio has taken to make sure that your election results can be reported as quickly and accurately as possible? And are there other actions that you have taken to improve the timeliness and accuracy of election results? Yeah, Congressman, thank you for the question. Uh, I wrote a mission statement on my chief of staff's dry array summer of 2020. And I said, when Ohioans go to bed on election night, they will know and they will believe the results of the 2020 presidential election. We accomplished both of those missions. It, it's about logistics and, and preparation. Um, it, it's about making sure that you have the, the procedures in place to quickly tabulate, but to never sacrifice accuracy for speed. And that's the balance that we've struck here in Ohio. And one of the reasons why we were able to, to report our results on election night is that we process our absentee ballots ahead of time. I know your state doesn't do that, Candidly, it's something that you all should look at because we don't count ballots until uh, the polls are closed on election night, but we do process them ahead of time. We check the identification. Heck, even taking them out of their envelopes and flattening them out so they're ready to go through the scanner, that's a process that takes a while. Uh, and, and those are the kind of things that we do in Ohio to make sure that we can deliver those results on election night. Also, again, that decentralized nature of how this is done. It's done at 88 different county boards of elections and making sure that they have the tools necessary uh, to, to get that job done has been one of our top priorities. I think the uh, the phrase in the Army for that would be slow is steady, smooth is fast. Um, did you Very good. Yes, sir. Did you have any issues establishing and implementing those processes? And, and as you look to other states and as you travel around, you talk to other secretaries of state, um, you know, are other states well equipped or, or well suited to adopt similar best practices or are there resource constraints along these lines that may require federal support? You know, the, the, the thing is, if you've seen the way one state runs elections, then you've seen the way one state runs elections, right? They're all different. Um, and so a lot of those would require changes at the state level, but that is the time to do that well in advance of the next presidential election. And so if your state has laws that prevent the boards of elections from being able to process absentee ballots and get them ready to go and count them immediately as soon as the polls close, then that's something that you should look at. Uh, as far as uh, constraints on resources. Some of this stuff isn't expensive. I'll give you, give you an example. Uh, in 2020, we directed our county boards of elections to consider spending some of their HAVA money or CARES Act money on a simple thousand dollar machine that cuts open envelopes. Our rural boards have been using the old slicer to cut it open. Uh, it just a process improvement like a thousand dollar envelope slicing machine uh, can be a big improvement. But yes, federal support is important and we've uh, used it well here in Ohio. And, and one last thing, when we um... We're going into the 2020 elections in Michigan, and, and obviously with a large number of absentee ballots, there was, uh, I'm not tracking how other states were dealing with this at the judicial level, but we temporarily had a judicial opinion that uh, ballots could be received after the time polls closed, so long as they were postmarked you know, by the date of the election. Um, now we've seen similar processes like that in, in California, um, in New York. I have, we have colleagues here in the house who had to wait several months in order to learn whether or not they've won or lost their primary in, in, in some elections um, or, or general election as well. Can you speak to just what you have seen in term, well, I guess if you could just remark on that, I know I have 30 seconds left, so we'd just love your yeah. quick thoughts. Some of the worst things that happen in elections administration happen as a result of crisis opportunism at a 
the, the, the things that, that, that go wrong elections generally aren't some sort of cloak and dagger secretive operation. It happens in the plain light of day in a courtroom. And those kind of last minute decisions are very problematic. Election law should be made at the state house, never at the courthouse. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I yield back. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from New Jersey, uh, Mr. Van Drew. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and ranking member. And thank you for the witnesses for testifying today before committee. Ms. Howard, in your written testimony, you assert that the loss of election administration expertise and experience is likely to spur further disinformation. And in it, and use a Michigan County's mistakes in the 2020 election as an example of why having informed and knowledgeable election officials is so very crucial and very critical. I agree with you that in order for your people to have faith in elections and for our elections to occur smoothly, we need to have election officials who are willing and able to correctly do their jobs. It's important. I also believe that people need to have confidence in their technology and in their equipment that is used to count their votes. You made one mention of Dominion and these Dominion voting machines in your testimony, but did not elaborate on the distrust in those machines. It's important to ensure that election officials are using the very best technology available and possible. Just last month, CISA published a report which highlighted issues with Dominion's technology, with one concern being that the authentication mechanism used is susceptible to forgery. That's just unacceptable. I don't, we can't live with that. We need election integrity. In addition to having qualified election officials, do you think it's important to have machines and software that are, sec that are secure and not susceptible to forgery. So that's my first question. My next question is, in my district, there were thousands upon thousands of people who received multiple ballots in the mail. Ballots for people who used to live at that residence. Ballots for people who had passed away. The list goes on and on. I'd like to know what you feel about that. New Jersey carelessly sent out millions of live ballots to people who did not request them, which rightfully caused great concern among South Jersey voters. It's no surprise that voters worry and wonder about the validity of voting. Do you think that states are sending out millions of unsolicited ballots, which are often drawn from outdated voter rolls and do you think that in any way could possibly promote election security? So those are my two questions. And uh, I thank you for your time. Thank you so much for your questions. Um, so first I'll say that no system is 100% secure. Um, in the election security sphere, we are all endeavoring to make our election systems more resilient. Uh, the three main prongs of the election security um, stool, if you will, are to have paper ballots, post-election audits where you actually go back and review um, those paper ballots and solid cybersecurity practices across the board. So making sure- May I interrupt just for a second? I'm sorry to do that. When you say paper ballots, do you mean paper backup? Or do you mean that actually you prefer paper ballot system period? Paper ballot system period. Okay. So, and, and you're gonna explain why. So the voting on paper ballots ensures that in the event that there are any questions about the accuracy of elections, you can go back to the record that the voter voted on and check and confirm the accuracy of the outcome that's been reported. Um, and you saw post-election audits conducted across the country after the 2020 election and again after the 2022 primaries, um, and you will see more and more audits conducted after the 2022 um, midterms. And so um, to your second question, um, you know, mistakes happen in elections. No election is perfect. However, election officials have a number of safeguards um, built into all of the processes and all of the um, cycles 
in our um, election system. So they have safeguards built into the voter registration process. They have safeguards um, built into the absentee ballot voting process. They have safeguards um, implemented in voting on in person on election day. So even in the event of mistakes or errors, these safeguards are put into place to protect um, the integrity of our elections and to ensure that eligible voters can cast a, a ballot. Real quick, I know I only have a couple seconds. Um, the, the I'm sorry. The, 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 old we, machine, the time, time is up. up. Okay. Yeah, Thank you very much. Of course. Um, I will now recognize Ms. the gentleman from Nevada, Ms. Titus, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to join all of you in wishing Chairman Benny Thompson a quick recovery. We miss him and we hope he's doing okay. You know, it, it, we heard all the testimony and I agree with it that uh, election security is a constantly evolving threat to um, our whole democratic process. The environment changes from one cycle to the next. <laughs> In 2016, we were primarily concerned about Russian interference. Then in 2020, it was the former president's big lie that kind of was the biggest threat to elections. And now during the 2022, we need to look at what is in the political environment that could again threaten our elections. And I believe it's those domestic threats that are the most serious that we need to worry about. Last month, I wrote a letter to Secretary Mayorkas. Many of the members of this committee signed on to it to raise concerns about the increased threat environment as a result of the Supreme Court's decision to overturn the right to abortion. I cited an analysis from the Southern Nevada Counterterrorism Center that found that domestic violence extremists motivated by the heightened political environment could threaten our midterm elections. And the report predicted that the threats would increase against our election workers. In fact, in 2019, the number of attacks in the U.S. against abortion providers more than doubled. And I'm afraid that our elections will be bear the brunt of that uh, in the upcoming months and that our election poll workers could be the targets as well. I would ask Secretary Oliver if he has taken any steps to protect elections in New Mexico against this heightened threat environment uh, post Dobbs decision and how this committee can work with DHS to kind of navigate this uh, threatening environment for our elections as we move towards November. Thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, we certainly are. And I'll, let me just say this. Um, all of these potential threats that you just cited uh, on the cyber front, you know, resulting from continued uh, unhappiness with the outcome of the 2020 election, um, the, you know, in 2020, of course, we were dealing with um, civil unrest across the country um, leading into elections. Uh, and so, you know, response to the Dobbs decision, uh, you know, you know, potentially could see similar things. So yes, to answer your question, we, we very much are. We coordinate very closely with not only our federal law enforcement, but our state police and our local law enforcement partners. We meet with them regularly. We set up virtual situation rooms in the lead up to and on election day um, to monitor not just the cyber environment to ensure that it is secure, but the physical environment of our, vote, uh, our polling places and any place where voting activity or uh, ballot processing activity is going on around the state. We continue to learn more and so we continue to develop more tools and plans for how to deal with that more effectively as each election passes. Well, it sounds like New Mexico is doing a good job. Some of the rest of us could learn from you establishing these best practices. Any one thing you could recommend that we ought to go home and talk about to our own state election departments? One great thing that we're doing here in New Mexico, and I know some other states are doing this as well, is we've also formed a partnership with our New Mexico State Air National Guard. Uh, their cyber task force um, comes and works on site with us during the election process as well. So we've added additional eyes and ears and expertise to monitor our cyber environment uh, to ensure that that's safe. And, and it's been a wonderful partnership. I recommend it in every state. Well, we certainly do that. Thank you so much. I yield back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Higgins. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank our panelists for appearing before us today virtually and in person. Uh, Mr. Chairman, election fraud is a, is a reality throughout the history of modern man across the world. Fraud and criminal behavior is as old as mankind itself. It's as old as mankind's tendency to succumb to failure of spirit. We are failed and fallen since Adam, and our elections are no exception to that. I read a quote from a political article regarding a University of Pennsylvania research scholar immediately after presidential election. He said, how could this be? He researched exit poll numbers that he was familiar with that had been reported on the night of the election. And he says he went down a rabbit hole of statistical analysis in search of explanations for the votes that seemed to have magically appeared. A week after the election, he shared a draft of his finding with his colleagues, scholars all, and the conclusion was that, I quote, fraud was an unavoidable hypothesis, close quote. His analysis wound up spreading widely drawing thousands of responses from around the country. People who believed, as he did, that the election had been stolen. It's a quote from a political article, but it's about the 2004 election, the Bush and Kerry. This was a Democrat analyst. You understand, ladies and gentlemen, my colleagues on both sides of the aisle, election fraud and compromised elections, it's not new as old as man itself. What's new now is the digital age. Nobody had an iPhone in the 2000 election of Bush and Al Gore, highly controversial. In 2004, there was no Facebook. Now we face a digital era where the theater of engagement has changed and, and nowhere more so than in our sovereign state's responsibility to carry out solid elections every year that the American people can depend upon. So the real challenge right now is how will our sovereign states present best models for dealing with the perception amongst the American citizenry, that our elections lack integrity, that their votes won't count. This must be addressed at the state level. I, for one, do not support the federalization of our elections. We're a representative republic of sovereign states. This is a, this is a state's role. And therefore, the best practices of those states amongst the sovereign states that have provided solid, secure elections, cycle after cycle. This must be shared and encouraged amongst your state partners across the country. So I asked Secretary LaRose, if you're prepared for a question, sir. Yes. As we saw at the 2020 election, due to the, the COVID pandemic, as Americans are concerned, it was quite convenient, the pandemic, mail-in ballots. And it certainly presented challenges state by state. But how do we deal with this? Millions and millions and millions of mail ballots, mostly unrequested, some arguably outside the parameters of the law of that sovereign state wherein they were delivered. These are constitutional questions that will be settled ultimately in Article 3 adjudicated and we'll learn from our challenges of the 2020 election cycle. But I ask you, Secretary LaRose, during the COVID pandemic, our country had to make a dramatic shift regarding how our country was forced to make a dramatic shift. They found themselves making that, that choice on how to conduct elections. What were some lessons learned 
sir, and how can that be shared with the rest of the country as we move towards this election cycle to encourage Americans that our, indeed, our elections are indeed secure and that actions have been uh, embraced within the sovereign states to make certain that our elections are secure. So the time has expired, but you can answer the question concisely, please. Yeah, I'll answer the question briefly. Resist the, 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 the temptation for crisis opportunism. The way that your state has run elections has been put in place for a reason. Follow your state laws. Work with your state legislature to make changes if you need to. Don't allow the courts uh, to, to make last minute changes in your elections and mind the logistics. Pay attention to the nuts and bolts of getting ballots to people that should have them and getting them back. Uh, and not uh, doing things that are sort of novel just because you're in a crisis. Thank you. Um, I will now recognize. I will now recognize the gentlewoman from uh, Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, uh, and uh, good morning uh, to all of the witnesses. Let me be very clear of the importance of this hearing, and I will concisely take the ultimate. Uh, reason, though over the years we have looked at the questions of voter registration, machine, cybersecurity, all important issues for this very uh, focused committee on Homeland Security. But the real issue is in the aftermath of the 2020 elections, wrapped up in the big lie, and the continuation of the big lie is really the question of threats to the physical security of elections with an increase in threats to elections officers and a heightened risk of officials acting improperly due to disinformation. That is simply uh, what we are facing uh, in our ability uh, to really carry a legitimate hearing, excuse me, legitimate uh, elections uh, that are guided by, as the previous witness said, by the laws of the state and not guided by misinformation, disinformation, and violence. This is what we're facing. I was appalled at the threats of the elections officials in uh, Atlanta, in Georgia, in the last election, still unchecked today. I'm appalled at the state laws that have criminalized anyone trying to be a good Samaritan with a glass of water. So, Mr. Uh, uh, Talese uh, Oliver, let me ask you as relates to election officials protection. Funding often does not reach its intended target. What is hindering those funds for reaching the election official? Mr. Oliver. Uh, Congresswoman. Uh, Madam Oliver, I'm sorry. Is it Secretary that's okay. Oliver? <laughs> I just want to make sure you met me. Uh, yeah, Congresswoman, I think there's a, a couple of issues. I think first and foremost, one of the biggest challenges we have, for example, in my state, and I know many of my colleagues have shared similar concerns, um, because the funding that we've received so far, which by the way, we are incredibly grateful for, and I, I will never stop thanking you all for what you have allocated to the states to help in our work, uh, because it, it it has come sporadically uh, in lump sum payments, and, and we don't necessarily know when or if there will be more funding coming. We've had to be extremely diligent and thoughtful about making those funds last as long as possible to sustain the programs that we've built around election security and cybersecurity. Um, so often that means we are holding on to funds at the state level, uh, you know, wait, waiting to see what we are going to continue to need in the future uh, because we can't necessarily count on that additional funding. And then, uh, Madam Congresswoman, I know, Congresswoman, I know that um, some states, uh, like my colleague in Minnesota, for example, um, when the federal funding is allocated, um, he then has to go through the approval of the state legislature. Um, and that timing doesn't necessarily align for um, when those funds are allocated and when the secretary uh, can then Thank you. get a hold of them. Thank you. I've, I've got only a short period of time, so I see the log jam that we need to address. Let me ask Ms. Howard um, again on the question of election security and the attack on election workers. I think your testimony mentioned that election workers are simply leaving their positions. Uh, in my time as a public servant and going before the voters, it was an honor to be uh, engaged in the election process. What are some of the things that we can do immediately to help fill these positions as well as prevent more workers from leaving? Um, I'm now in the midst of a Judiciary Committee hearing uh, trying to ban assault weapons. I don't know uh, with this rise in gun violence whether someone will think it's important 
uh, for their position to come to a poll with a gun. Uh, what should we do and how should the federal government be involved? I frankly believe we should uh, be doing a lot more with uh, persons on the ground. Ms. Uh, Howard, thank you for your work at the Brennan Center. Thank you so much for the question. Um, there, there are several things that Congress can do. So first, Congress can allocate funding specifically for um, uh, training for election officials about how to, um, for their physical safety, and they can allocate funding so that election officials can enhance um, the security at their personal residences. Um, Congress can also um, uh, request that CISA um, provide specific training to election officials to protect their personal security. Um, in addition, Congress can work with the multiple federal agencies and departments that are working to help protect our election officials to make sure that their efforts are effective. Hey, uh, just very quickly then, in my one second that I have, let me just stick with Ms. Howard. About uh, I'm, so, I'm sorry. Problems of your time has expired. We, we do have a number of people. So. I will submit it in writing. Thank you so very much. I, I yield want, back. I want to be fair. I, can, um, I now recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Garbarino. For, is Mr. Garbarino here? Okay. Yeah, online. Oh. Hey. Thank you, uh, Chairman and uh, Ranking Member, for, uh, for host, holding this hearing. Uh, Mr. Uh, Secretary LaRose, I had a question for you. You uh, talked briefly about uh, your partnership with CISA. And in 2019, when Russian individual, Russia connected individuals attempted to hack your state's system, is that where that relationship started with CISA, or was, did you have something going on before with them? And and and, and how did they help, or how did the federal government uh, assist you after your uh, the attempted hack in 2019? Yeah, I can tell you that I made it a priority from my first couple of days in office to get to know my parts and others. And we worked closely with the cybersecurity teams in other states, as well as uh, my partners at, at CISA and then down to the county level. So it's about it's about laterally and, and up and down. Uh, so we've been working with them ever since uh, I came into office. But that partnership paid off, as you mentioned, when our state, like many other states, was uh, the subject of a uh, uh, what, what resulted to in a ransomware uh, attempt. OK, so uh, with your with you know working with CISA, they are the uh that you know they are the head you know here for uh, cyber uh, cyber security infrastructure security agency and now uh the election system has been declared as critical infrastructure uh from uh so their job is to protect to protect it from cyber and physical threats what services does CISA provide now uh that are most impact impactful uh what are things uh, that they can do better on you know, you know what's good what's bad about what uh, your relationship with them yeah, so uh, first of all, information flow has gotten a lot better. At, at one point in time, it was kind of like we had to pull information out of them, uh, and, and I can tell you that that's gotten better over time, and they've been purposeful about that. Uh, there's a whole variety of services that they offer down to a, a county level. I've actually required, as part of our security directives, that 1.0, 2.0, 3.0 that I've put out. Uh, we've required our counties to engage in those services. Uh, one question is just one of, of resources. And sometimes uh, there is a backlog in actually receiving those services. I know CIS has worked to address that, uh, but if there was one helpful thing, uh, it would be working to, to increase the resources at CISA so that those service, services can be delivered more quickly uh, without the delay that currently exists. So they're doing a good job. You just need to, uh, we just need to increase their, uh their funding so they can they can do it better <laughs> and the, the team at this is incredibly purposeful that from the director on down in fact she took the time to come visit us in ohio personally just two weeks ago and uh, we appreciate the partnership with them oh great yeah we have a very good work, working relationship with her the director recently as well we think she's doing a great job over there i appreciate that uh, miss Lozen. Uh, i'm going to yield to my colleague mr fluger from texas i know he had some more questions thank uh, you so i yield uh, to uh, thank you for the time and uh, I don't, nothing is more important than the uh, the integrity of our elections right now. And there is distrust in the American public. There is a distrust. Um, and I remind my colleagues that, in fact, a former gubernatorial candidate in the state of Georgia still won't concede the election uh, for governor there. So, um, you know, the distrust here, and I, I'll uh, focus my questions with Ms. Howard. You, you mentioned safeguards a number of times, safeguards for elections to make sure that they're secure, to make sure that the trust, the public has the trust so on the subject of identifications, IDs, 
Uh, would you say that the use of IDs to register, the use of IDs to actually vote and prove who you are, and the use of IDs to then match up when you're counting those votes would be a safeguard that would enhance that trust and the election integrity in all states? No, I understand that. I, I want to I hear your take on safeguards because you speak with great authority on this. I'm so sorry, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, I think whether or not a photo ID is critical is depends upon the other safeguards that are in the system. You can't just look at um, one piece. Sure. Without... So in states like New York or New Jersey where ballots can be mailed without actually requesting them, wouldn't that be a good safeguard to have that the ID then matches up the person who is voting or a signature? So in many states, the absentee ballot process requires um, that the voter sign the um, return envelope. Some states require an additional witness signature on there. So again, it depends on all the other safeguards that are in the process. So would you say in your comment previously, you said all states have different, uh, different takes on it. Uh, are you for the federalization of our election system? So I think that there have been important federal laws that protect the safeguard that protect every American, uh, every citizen's right to vote. So, for instance, in HAVA, which was passed after the 2000 election, it included uh, mandatory provisional ballots be offered to individuals um, that have issues at the polls on election day as a safeguard. I think the safeguards that we need can be based around an ID that tells you who that person is, especially in states that don't have the signature requirement or that mail ballots to people who might not have asked for them. The American public deserves that. We have to have a system that has integrity and that we trust. And right now there is a great distrust in our election system. Thank, to, thank the gentleman from New York for yielding the time. The chair now recognizes Mr. Clyde, the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Clyde, for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Chairman Torres. Uh, the safety and well-being of election administrators and a robust, secure election infrastructure is paramount to a functioning republic. In recent years, election security has become an even greater concern because of the radical changes and, quote, flexibilities that were allowed and attributed to COVID-19. For example, the Supreme Court in Pennsylvania ruled just weeks before a presidential election that ballots should be accepted as late as the Friday after Election Day, even ballots without a postmark. This was, of course, a direct encroachment on the authority of the Pennsylvania State Legislature, which enacted strong election integrity regulations and voter ID. And this certainly caused much confusion for election administrators and for the voters. This issue hits right at home with my constituents, as our very own Secretary of State unilaterally altered Georgia's statutory requirements, requiring the authentication of absentee ballot signatures with an unlawful consent decree. Understandably, people are concerned with the administration of the 2020 elections because partisan officials bypassed the legislative process, effectively changing the rules of the game as the game was being played. According to the documentary 2000 Mules, thousands of ballots were illegally harvested by political operatives and placed into drop boxes in at least five states, which is a direct violation of state laws, which clearly say that you can only return ballots for immediate family members. To be sure, our local election administrators are not to blame for the poor decisions of some state elected officials that cast doubt on our election integrity. I applaud the efforts of election administrators in spite of rapidly changing guidance to administer elections in accordance with the Constitution and state laws, and I agree that their safety is paramount. Nevertheless, these constantly changing election laws from left-leaning judges amid a presidential election rightfully led to voters having questions and frustrations about the integrity of the elections. Strong election laws like Georgia's SB 202 will do a lot to ensure confidence in elections across the country. But hand recounts of paper ballots by local election officials would go a long way to further the confidence of concerned voters. In fact, I think that in my home state, every election should have an automatic 10% recount of random counties to act as an audit of the results. So Ms. Howard, to your comment, I think uh, uh, that what you said about the need for election audits is absolutely correct. While I believe stronger election laws that restore confidence in our election process will reduce the threats of violence toward election officials, I believe that local law enforcement is the first and best line of defense for these types of threats. 
and we make sure that those who commit unlawful acts of violence are prosecuted at the state level. It's no secret that my Democrat colleagues have exploited these threats to justify a federal takeover of elections. Make no mistake, this hearing will be used as a platform by the Democrat majority to push for total federal control like Mr. Sarbanes preventing Election Subversion Act of 2021. With that being said, I will direct my first question to Mr. LaRose. Mr. LaRose, as you know, the Democrat so-called election subversion bill, like Char 4064, would set forth burdensome requirements for federal elections. For example, it prevents meaningful, meaningful poll observer access by mandating an eight-foot minimum distance in order to observe ballot counts across the country. I'm aware that there have been threats against election administrators in the state of Ohio. Is local law enforcement equipped to investigate and arrest the individuals who made these kind of threats, sir? More than adequately equipped, Congressman. And, and in fact, we send a memo to all of our law enforcement partners before each election, uh, making sure that they know not only the, the rights, but the responsibilities that they have to safeguard not only our poll workers, but voters, really everybody involved in the process. We've even gotten all of our elections officials to now be equipped with police radios uh, through our state's marks system in the case of an emergency so that we can communicate directly with law enforcement. So local law enforcement is more than adequately equipped to handle this. Um, next question. Yes. How would such a federal regulation imposing an eight foot observer distance impact your constituents confidence that the poll observer could do their work effectively? Well, observation is crucial, but really what, what that is, is micromanagement. For somebody in Washington to think that they need to tell uh, 88 county boards of elections in Ohio and how many hundreds of other county boards of elections across the country, how far away observers should stand is the height of federal government arrogance, in my opinion. Thank you. I, I believe that uh, local control is best when it comes to things like this. Uh, Ms. Howard, as you may be aware, poll workers at a large polling center in Detroit, Michigan, lock the windows with cardboard pizza boxes to bar observer access to the 2020 election. Uh, do you believe it is appropriate for windows to be blocked so that the views of observers are obstructed? Thank you for your question. I'm not familiar with the um, allegations about what happened in Detroit, um, but I will say in general, there are laws in Michigan and many other states which allow for observers at various different processes, at various different um, points of the election process. And those observers authorized under law should not be obstructed. The gentleman's time has expired. Thank you, and I yield back. And I now recognize the gentlewoman from Florida, Ms. Kamek. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, very timely topic as we head into a very important election in this year's midterms. And I think it's something that we all have grave concerns about. Of course, election integrity is a driving issue. And I think as a, a fundamental right to, to go out and vote, uh, we need to really ensure that people's ballots are being counted as they intend them to be counted when they are cast. And so I know folks across the country are, are really watching this and um, members have been coming and going. So for our witnesses, I'm just going to ask a couple of questions to make sure that I understand exactly uh, where y'all stand on this. So I'll start uh, with Miss Oliver. Do you believe that a government issued ID complete with a photo should be required to vote? And this question will go to all witnesses, but I will start with uh, Ms. Oliver. Thank you, Congresswoman. We do not require that here in New Mexico. It is one option. Uh, and I think as and many of the witnesses, excuse me, how can you verify the identity of an individual without a photo ID that is government issued? They are required to provide other identifiable information. Again, a, a photo ID is an option for voters. Um, they can also provide other forms of documentary ID or give a verbal confirmation of personal uh, private information to verify their identity. That doesn't seem particularly secure, so we might want to work on that. Uh, Mr. Kelly. I remind myself that I am retired so I can give my personal opinion now. I don't believe it would be a bad thing to provide an ID uh, to increase voter confidence. Uh, I don't know ultimately what problem it solves in some cases, but I don't think it would be a bad idea. Okay, Ms. Uh, Howard. I think that it's hard to look at one piece of the um, election. Um, it's just a yes or no, ma'am. Do you believe that a government ID complete with a photo should be required to vote? No. And uh, Mr. LaRose. Congresswoman, the simple answer is yes, and most Americans believe that as well. And we should make sure everybody can get one easily and that we maintain accurate voter rolls. 
Absolutely. I think it's very curious that of, of the four witnesses that we have here today, three um, have said in some form or fashion that no photo ID should be required to vote, that a verbal confirmation uh, is all that is su to suffice that a person is who they say they are. I mean, I can go out and say that I'm Jennifer Aniston, but that doesn't make me Jennifer Aniston as much as I would like it to be. So we need to, I think, one, uh, if we're talking about this issue, start with the basic premise of verification. You need to have a photo ID to cash a check. You need a photo ID to live life. Uh, we require driver's licenses with photos to drive a car. There are basic things that we have to do in life that require photo IDs. I don't think that this is discriminatory in any shape, way, form, or fashion. And I would love to see our local officials work to really make sure that uh, it is as accessible and easy to get a government issued ID complete with a photo so that we don't have these questions down the road. I'm going to go to my second uh, question for the uh, witnesses. Do you believe that third party political organizations that are funded by political parties should be prohibited from signature verification? And I'll start with you, Mr. Rose, LaRose, excuse me. Yeah, in Ohio, that work of signature verification is done by sworn election officials from both parties and observed by the public if they wish to observe that. That's where signature verification should be done. That's how we do it in Ohio. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. LaRose. Ms. Howard. Um, thank you for the question. I, you know, I, I think that uh, Secretary LaRose brings up an important point. The um, signature verification procedures that I'm aware of are done by election officials, many of whom are, are sworn in and sworn to uphold the state and but not in Georgia. Constitution. Uh, Mr. Kelly. I believe in the exact same thing Secretary LaRose said. Thank you. Uh, and Ms. Oliver. I agree with Secretary LaRose, and I will just quickly add that in my state and many, we do allow political party observers of that process. I appreciate that. Um, for uh, Ms. Oliver and uh, Mr. LaRose, I am sure you all are aware of the ERIC system, the system that allows states to talk to each other. So if uh, a person um, who is registered to vote in Florida uh, passes away in Ohio, the two states can talk to each other to make sure that those voter uh, rolls are updated. Do you believe that each state should employ the use of the ERIC system? And I'll start with you, Ms. Oliver. Absolutely. We use it here and we encourage it everywhere. Thank you. Mr. LaRose. Great tool for fraud prevention and gives us a way to catch people that try to vote in multiple states. Even though that's rare, we can catch them now using Eric. Every state should consider using it. I appreciate it. Uh, my time has expired, so uh, I will submit my, the remainder of my questions for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Of course. Um, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Kansas, uh, Mr. LaTurner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. LaRose, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, it's uh, it's good to see you. Uh, I want to talk about a couple of things with you. First of all, the vulnerability disclosure policy. I'm interested in that. Could you talk about what that is and what that looks like and how it's implemented? Yeah. And congratulations on being the first state, by the way. Well, thank you. And it was written up by a number of publications at the time because it was kind of a novel thing. I enjoyed being able to stand in front of groups in 2020 and say, I'm the guy that runs Ohio's elections and I'm asking people to hack me. Now, of course, you'd get gasps and uh, you'd have to then explain it to people. What I'm saying is the good guys and gals, the white hacker, white hat or ethical hackers out there, sometimes they call themselves security researchers now, which is a more warm and fuzzy sounding thing. But the fact is there are folks out there that love to do this to find vulnerabilities. They're motivated by patriotic purposes to try to find uh, where those vulnerabilities exist and to tell us about them. So you can see our vulnerability disclosure policy if you go to ohiosos.gov or voteohio.gov and go right to the bottom of our website. It says vulnerability disclosure policy. And if you click on that, it says, hey, good guy hackers, if you find something, tell us. Now, you can't vandalize our site. You can't uh, cause some sort of a breach. But if you tell us, we'll not only fix the problem, but we'll recognize you. We had a, a great uh, uh, um, ethical hacker uh, on our stage at our election officials conference, and we gave him a big award. And that's the kind of thing that other states should be doing as well. I appreciate that. Uh, as you're aware, CIS offers a vulnerability disclosure policy platform to help federal agencies. Is, is this, in your opinion, something that CISA could engage in or should engage in with states uh, and uh, localities as well? Would that be helpful? 
Congressman, anything we can do to encourage and even incentivize this is, is, is good. Uh, we work currently with a private sector provider that helps get the word out to the hacker community that, hey, listen, Ohio wants to use your expertise and we'll recognize you for your efforts. Uh, but to do that through CISA would be a, a great tool as well. I read that uh, in one of your counties, they have 551 workers that need 846 for the uh, poll watchers. And I'm curious, uh, how do you plan to close that gap? This is a problem that states across the country are having. And what do you think the potential implications are for election integrity and security? Yeah, so we will close that gap, Congressman. It's something that uh, that we've been focused on really from the very beginning. You know, we've done creative things like recruit high school seniors through what we call the Youth at the Booth program. Uh, we've worked with my fellow veterans, asking them to, to answer a second call to duty, right, to continue fulfilling that oath that they took to preserve and protect the Constitution. Uh, we, we've worked with businesses, encouraging them to give their employees a day for democracy, give them a free day off, an uncharged day off to be poll workers. So those are kind of things we're doing, but we're also holding our boards of elections accountable. The reason you know that number is because we publicly report it now. And so those county boards of elections that don't have enough poll workers, they get the scrutiny and the pressure to, to, to make sure they get there by election day. It sounds like you're doing a lot of exciting things there. How many other states uh, are, are implementing the vulnerability, vulnerability disclosure policy? Do you have any idea? I believe it's in the single digits at this point, but it is growing. Okay. And what about the ideas that you talked about, the youth in the booth and things like that? Are you are you sharing these in uh, your, your professional organization or anything so other other states have the opportunity to benefit from your experience? Yeah, for us, it's the National Association of Secretaries of State. My friend and colleague from New Mexico is an active participant and former president of that organization. Uh, we got together just a couple of weeks ago in Baton Rouge, and we were exchanging ideas, uh, and this is exactly what we do. So, yeah, we love to steal each other's good ideas, and hopefully uh, my colleagues around the country steal some good ideas from Ohio. I appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Kelly, during your tenure in Orange, Orange County, your department would produce an election security playbook in conjunction with state and local officials in addition to the FBI and DHS. Can you talk more about this and the emphasis your office put on collaboration and partnerships? Because I think it's really key, uh, as I talked about with Secretary LaRose, that we're all, uh, we're all rowing in the same direction, that we're collaborating, we're sharing information uh, so that we can tackle this problem. Yes, sir. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, it was Collaboration was a big part of what we did in Orange County. In fact, I partnered at the table with DHS, FBI, local state uh, officials, uh, law enforcement, and we came up with a playbook and a design for responses on election day and leading up to election day. If you don't have that type of collaboration leading up to those uh, important elements, you, you're gonna have gaps, there's no question about it. And, and one other quick thing I would say as part of that playbook is doing things like list maintenance and increasing that list maintenance uh, effort before ballots go out so that you can improve voter confidence. That's a big part of it. I appreciate that. My time has expired, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. We are at the end of our hearing, but before I conclude, I do want to ask each witness, uh, what, what's the most important action that we in Congress can take to fundamentally enhance election security? And I'll start with uh, Secretary Oliver. Thank you again, Mr. Chair, and thank you so much for having me here today. I think it's been a very important discussion, uh, and I think that although we may share differing political views, uh, I think there have been a lot of consistent threads throughout this conversation, and hopefully that gives uh, you all and the American public increased confidence in our election process. Uh, Mr. Chairman, continue to support us uh, as election officials in our states. I think many commenters today have noted the importance of allowing states uh, and of, indeed the constitutional requirement to allow states to conduct elections. Uh, we do so many things in common uh, to ensure the integrity of our elections, but continue to support us in our efforts and particularly with, it doesn't have to be a lot, but ongoing funding so that we can protect our critical election infrastructure, which is a part of our national security infrastructure. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Mr. Kelly, what's the most important thing we can do in Congress? Mr. Chairman, I echo Secretary Oliver's comments and thank you very much for today's hearing. Two quick things. Uh, I believe funding is very important. Improving physical security at election offices will go a long way and that assistance is badly needed. And then raising awareness on this issue. Uh, it is very important that not only the American public become aware of this, but also local law enforcement leaders and election officials across the country. Ms. Howard? 
Uh, thank you so much for holding this hearing today. Um, I think the most important thing that Congress can do is to provide additional funding for election officials and to require the currently available funding to have a minimum spend for election security. Secretary LaRose. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we each have an important responsibility from the county level election officials, state officials to you all federal level. So I think that the first thing is uh, allow us to do our jobs and don't try to do our jobs for us by setting the specific rules surrounding elections administration, but do support us with the great resources that you offer right now from CISA. Consider growing those resources. Uh, one additional thing is that voter list maintenance is probably one of the most important responsibilities we have. Maintaining that very dynamic list that's constantly changing is hard. The federal government has resources that are not always made available to the states as far as verifying citizenship data, death records, those kind of things. So more data flow as it relates to voter list maintenance would also be very helpful. I thank the witnesses for their excellent testimony and the members for their questions. The members of the committee may have additional questions for the witnesses, and we ask that you respond expeditiously in writing to those questions. The chair reminds the members that the committee record will remain open for 10 business days without objection. The committee stands adjourned.
process. Uh, growing those resources. Uh, one addition.